Hello, meeting the water. Um, good evening. Uh, welcome everyone to here to the Community Preservation Committee. Uh, this is a public, publicly televised public meeting tonight. Uh, we have viewers out there in uh, TV, land. TV land, or maybe not live, but eventually uh, you get to uh, watch the shows again. So um, that's why everyone's looking so spectacular. <laughs> um, so, uh, without uh, further ado, this uh, meeting is the final presentations of project proponents. We'll be voting on project recommendations next week. Uh, we would ask people uh, not necessarily to repeat what we already know, but at least say enough to give uh, viewers a good scope of what the project is that's proposed. Uh, update us on uh, anything that's happened since last presentations. Uh, let us know exactly what uh, the proposal is at this uh, stage. Uh, we've, we've allocated about 15 minutes to each proposal. We have some flexibility. People don't have to take the full 15 minutes. If people would try to take uh, maybe about eight minutes for presentation time and allow seven or so minutes for discussion, uh, that would be most appreciated. So without further ado, our first one is the Bathing Beach Stabilization, uh, Alan Peral. revetment that was done about 12 years ago and which is actually shown uh, actually shown in the lower left hand corner um, approved by the Army Corps of Engineers smaller stone and with uh, filter fabric behind it has not held up to the uh, the rest of the nor'easters that tend to hit that um, and what is proposed is a larger, what we call an armor stone, so the stone is more substantial. It is what is further north, just north of it, and it's held up extremely well. The length is about 80 to 90 feet, um, and the cost of that is about 100,000. As the committee can recall, we were also looking for some beach stabilization that was gonna be a ticket of about 700,000, and I think we're gonna try to see what our chances are getting some state money, because there is a bond that has funds that have come up this year and we'll try our best at, at going after that. And failing that, we may come back to town meeting next year. Um, but the most pressing thing is that. And one of the things that has come up, if you turn to page two of the handout I have, between the last time I was here and now, the Department of Conservation and Recreation, they do annual reevaluations of coastal areas. So Roger Fernandez's office got this, and Roger sent it to me and a few other people. And if you'll notice, I've highlighted a few areas. Again, it's done by the state, so it's the Otis Street 3A. Their estimate, interestingly, 99,360, so it's essentially the 100,000 we're talking about. And if you look at the corrections, it says downgrade the condition to F, failing. Um, it had been prior a C or fair. And if you look at under the 2003 structure assessment, the primary revetment structure has been downgraded to condition failing due to revetment collapse with coastal bank erosion. I think that actually describes better than I could what our condition is. So I think we've talked about it, and actually the state is essentially confirming that. Um, 
Now, one could say, well, do you think you can get state funding for that? My concern would be when. You know, I, I think we may have a better shot with the beach, you know, down the road, because it, if you notice, it does actually continue to talk about the beach, because it talks about the length being roughly 1,000 feet. Well, that's continuing to the beach. So I think it is a good argument. And if we were to have to go after state funding, we could say at least the town had spent money on doing part of the overall project. So I don't think I really need to go into a whole lot more detail. What we're trying to accomplish is what's in the third picture, which uh, should be page three. So that's kind of a visualization of what the armor stone would look like if it was done. The largest stone with filter fabric, and the idea is to plant like American beach grass and Rosa Rugosa and the like behind it, so you'd end up having a combination of hard and soft solution. Uh, and again, this would stabilize the uh, the area with the bathhouse, the um, <coughs> and which, for what the committee is interested in, we actually have an RFP out right now that we're expecting to get responses on by the 24th of this month for something to do with snack shop and uh, revitalize the bathhouse. So we've had two respondents who seem interested so far, so hopefully this time next year or by the time the summertime we'll have something in place. So nice evening, by the way, to talk about the uh, bathing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes? What is the <laughs> lifespan of something like this? Like, uh, or it depends on the weather? Or yeah, it, it, somewhat. But I, this is so substantial. I mean, I think you could safely say this is a 50 to 75 year solution. I mean, we're also talking, the elevation is, I'm um, actually guys are raising because I forgot this point, the elevation is about two to three feet higher. So it accounts for the new femur elevation. So instead of being at like a 12 to 14 height, we're talking 14 to 16 feet. So uh, given that, it's probably good until the next femur evaluation, I guess mm -hmm. I would say. The existing armstone's doing a pretty good job, and I, I would, it's not dissimilar to some of the other seawalls we have around the harbor. But if you look back, most of them are 50 or 60 year, years old. Some of them in need of repair, mind you, but they've lasted 50 or 60 years. I yes. have one question, because um, I haven't had a chance to talk to you since the storm <coughs> of just last week, where Nantasket Beach really mm. got hit badly, right. Situate <coughs> got hit badly, and I'm just, I haven't even gone down to look. What, the bathing beach, have you been down there? Yeah, I it mean, wasn't as bad as last year. Okay. I mean, it got to the edge of the asphalt, so again, it's kind of a precarious situation we're in, right. but it wasn't as bad as last year's coastal storms. Uh, there was more work around Town Pier. Irma Lauder actually went by, and the, the benches that are right near Town Pier and the harbor masses, the lower, the legs are actually underwater, but that's a, a somewhat lower elevation than what we have. Um, so we, it was very close, but it didn't erode any more asphalt, but just to the edge of doing so. Right, and I ask that only because, um, you know, we're always talking about that 100 year up storm mm -hmm. that everybody talks about, and yet it seems like it happens once a year now, yeah, yeah. you know? So uh, just wanted to make sure that what we're talking about would take care of something like we saw last year or Certainly the armstone, the armstone section would, uh, unquestionably. You know, the, we, we're going to need to do something with, with the beach pretty soon. Right. Yes. Um, Abby, have you reviewed this and where, you know, what's the purview of the Conservation Commission and or Coastal Zone Management or Chapter 91 or any of those things? Yeah, certainly all three of those things will come into play um, in terms of permitting, and so that's something that we have worked pretty closely with, with Alan um, and Roger Fernandez with, to talk about, you know, the needs going forward. I think in the commission's purview, you know, there's certainly the resource protection piece. Um, the bank armament is essentially replacing almost in kind just beefier um, what is already existing. And so I think from a, an impact uh, to resources, that's probably fairly straightforward. Um, I think when it comes to the, the rest of the beach management and that kind of stuff. The commission has requested um, that the Harbor Development Committee come up with a beach management plan, and that's something that folks are working on right now with, with the engineering team to do. So there's sort of the two-piece um, solution. I had a question on the plan <coughs> section. Um, in the plan, the, I understand that we're at the index, and the extent of the field riprap would put it, it shows the failed riprap here, Gary, but I think we're probably going to end it. It's going to be where the existing one is. Okay. I admit, okay. I looked at that myself tonight and said, you know, some of you may look at that and say where the failed riprap starts because we really can't hook it into the parking lot there. Right. So it probably we'll will be a, a like kind exchange of smaller stone for larger stone. That's here where we would start to tie in the beach stabilization when and if we do it. 
So that the, having that located uh, such a, as you're describing, that would tend to uh, mitigate, you know, at the apex it wants to erode more than on a straight line. Correct. So the other um, question I would have here, it's, uh, the assumption that I have here is that if this work is not done, ultimately we're gonna, uh, the erosion, we're going to start to lose the bathhouse and that end of the parking lot. Correct. And then the, uh, the third question I have is, why is the filter stone optional on the new proposed <coughs> plan? Wouldn't you want to do that as part of the basic uh, scope? Yeah, I don't know why he has it as optional. I think you, you, would, you would do it. I think it's actually, it's either a filter fabric or a, or a optional stone filter. I think that's probably the option. I think it's either. Oh, I see. You know, so I think he's saying optional stone filter, but I think that's off, That's an option to filter fabric. Could you explain this function? Well, the idea is it's for the fines that get through. I mean, the stones are fairly sizable. So the concern is with backwash, that if for some reason there was rain or something else, the filter fabric of that stone takes the fines from you know, getting their way out into the harbor. You know, because obviously sands and silts and things like that are a lot finer can find their way through larger stones in particular. So if the way it hits it, you know, it's another sand the beach, it gets caught. Correct. It stops it from going back. Right. So it's kind of like eroding from the inside. Correct. Yeah. Because, you know, obviously if we had enough wash, you could take the luma with it. Yeah. You know, and that's what you're trying to prevent. I have just one last yeah. question, and that's, um, for those of us who don't know what it's like to work with the state as far as getting money, right. because to me this seems <coughs> just like so obvious that the state that has coastal money and uses it, what what kind of time frame are you talking about that if you, um, you know, made a proposal, I mean obviously the work is done, why wouldn't the state fund it? At what point? It's probably, they look at harbor areas like ourselves as being, in some ways, if I'm, I'm going to get out of Hingham for a second, mm -hmm. probably being less pressing than Nantasket, where it's pretty obvious that you're talking about affecting a road and, you know, utilities and whatever, is we have kind of an inner harbor, I, I guess in the scale of things, they don't think it's as large. Uh, on the plus side, however, and I'll give you the pluses, the state does look at it as, you know, we don't charge for people going to the beach, so mm -hmm. it's accessible to other people other than just people from town of Hingham. Certainly for the boat ramp, as Abby pointed out, we have to do, we have to also have to do a beach <coughs> management study or we can't get state funding for a boat ramp. We've got the state out there looking at that too and hopefully within the next two years we can get queued up to have the boat ramp done. And they see that similarly, is that doesn't stop anybody from anybody to get to Boston Harbor through there. So I think we do have some pluses right. and we did submit an overall master plan, it was called the blue plan of the whole harbor to the Seaport Bond Council two years ago. So it's not like we're not in the queue. Um, so I think I've been told it takes a while to get to their attention and uh, uh, Ken Corson who says like Situate has done quite well, but it took them a while You know so after like three or four years they started getting some harbor money some uh, Boat ramp money and you know as John Thomas who's on the Harbor Development Committee has done a good job of bird dogging for us You know the, the, the new bond bill and other things like that and we have representative Bradley and uh, uh, and our senator, Senator Hedlund, working on that, you know, mm -hmm. so we're, we're really trying to get their, their attention. And so, in fact, we have a meeting with them shortly, I think, yeah. yes. uh, on those issues. So we're, we're going to try to ramp that up, mm -hmm. like this winter and spring. And does the county reflect revenues that the state gets from taxes and gas taxes? Uh, not gas taxes. I believe that the boat ramp money it comes from uh, fishing and boating. Uh, fish and game. And, fish and game. And, and Seaport Council. And Seaport Council. There is a very large bond bill in the Senate now, in the House Senate combined, uh, that has distinct uh, sections only for improvement of seacoast facilities, Good. building and rebuilding, uh, such as ramps, beaches, marshlands, and boat ramps. In, in all honesty, Marshfield and Situate are probably a little more aggressive than we've been, you know, going after those funds. I mean, to their success, they've been actually been got something, but I, I think. We're starting to rattle the state's cage a little bit, so I think we hopefully the next one's in the queue. Okay. And the hundred thousand includes all the costs, no for the legal or engineering or anything like yeah, that. Yeah, we we've got some engineering money, so we'll essentially have a design for this. So our, the thirty thousand was expended by the town a year ago gives us the engineering money. So this is really just construction money and, and some construction oversight. And actual quotes, do you have those? <coughs> no, but I mean I was uh, relieved to see that the Bourne Engineering's estimate is the same as Paul Harris's <laughs> when it came in. You know, I look, it's 99.9 or whatever it is, and ours is 100,000, so I think that's a pretty good estimate. Yeah. Construction timeline would be what? 
that's fairly quick. Um, the work on this thing would probably be done in l less than a month, probably from the time they actually start on the site, because of the fact these stones are large. I mean, you know, the prep time might be a little longer. But once you start placing stones, it's a fairly quick operation. You can do it in the dry too. But you'd foresee starting when? You know, probably in the fall. I mean, the ideal thing would be to wait until the bathing season was over and do it from, let's say, October to November would be the mm -hmm. perfect scenario. Okay. Any further questions from the committee? Any questions from the public? Yes, sir. And when members of the public ask questions, could you give us your name and address? And if you're affiliated with any uh, organization or town body, let us know that as well. Okay. Ed Johnson, 108 Ward Street. I'm also a trustee of the Baden Beach. Uh, to answer Joe's question about the storm last week, I was down there at the high tide at 12 o'clock. What saved us last week is there was some ice on the shore, so the waves coming in were dissipated oh. due to the ice, or else we would have had some oh, God, additional God. damage. God, thank you. Thank, thank you very you. much. An ice shield. Any further comments, questions uh, from the public? I just, I'm just very glad to see it because when I go swimming, I often do a little backstroke and sort of look all around, and I always was puzzled that we had a major armor stone, <laughs> and then suddenly a very abruptly stone about a quarter of the size. <coughs> I mean, visually it looks funny, and it, and it seems like the same specification a long time ago to, to put in something so slight. It would have been nice if they, you know, the right thing, but, you know, we're trying to rectify it. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Alan, and you did so well on this one. You get the opportunity <laughs> for an <laughs> for <laughs> encore, <laughs> encore presentation. Uh, we're my Harvard Development hat. Uh, request for some additional funding for a project that we actually, that was funded through this committee uh, uh, two years ago, town meeting. Uh, that's really just what I handed out was just a cover of two sheets. I think everyone's familiar with the Whitney Wharf pedestrian bridge or the concept of it. And the, um, the third page in, I thought, is still always the most telling to me, is the picture of the existing conditions. I mean, I think the most compelling reason when someone says, I don't think anyone would use the bridge, or why do we need a bridge? is when you really look at page three and you see the signal control box that we've been told by the state cannot go anywhere else, nor can the pole. Um, so, and I, I've probably told everyone the same story. The first time I was on the Harvard Development Committee, I had to be standing there looking at this and a young man asked if I need help getting across the street. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I think that underscores how difficult this area is. And, and the, so the thought process, as everyone knows, is to put it behind the three Otis Street property uh, get it over to Whitney Wharf, uh, where we'd land about two-thirds into Whitney Wharf. Um, and I think now that, you know, th this is start to me, they're starting to be, we're starting to coalesce to some of the ideas along the harbor because one thing that was allowed by town meeting about three years ago was the um, accessory use. So Red Eye Roasters is in because we actually changed the zoning to allow accessory uses in that zone. So now you have Red Eye Roasters, it's to me the best of public-private. You're going to end up having people, there's limited seating there, I think people naturally may go across the bridge. I think they'd go across the bridge if they were just walking. I know John Thomas walks along the harbor most every day, um, that the weather's good. And I think more people would. And some of you may or may not be aware, but the FOSS committee, which I also serve on, um, is now recommending, they're going to be recommending to town meeting this year that a memorial to Herbert Foss, our only Medal of Honor winner, be done at what is now the Veterans Park. So like two prop the next property to Whitney Wharf, and I think the committee finally agreed that, okay, well, if the bridge is in, this whole area becomes more accessible. Um, one of the downsides of Whitney, the fence has been replaced by this, uh, at this, with money the selectmen had, has been this parking space for two or three people, two or three cars, but most people don't use it. And I think it's going to be more of a pedestrian destination with this bridge. Um, so that's the overview of why we think we need it. The reason why we're looking for an additional 40000 is it's been two years. Um, Construction prices have escalated because the economy is a little bit better. We originally wanted 300000 anyway. We're cut down. Um, and even New York Bridge has said the cost of the same type of bridge who gave us the estimate is about, you know, 30 plus to 30 to 40000 um, So in a nutshell, I still think we get a fair amount of bang for our buck in terms of what it will do along the waterfront. And again, with the boat ramp, the bathhouse, and all these other things, I think we're starting to make some headway down by the harbor. 
Have the issues about the easement and the storage of the moorings and all that been resolved? That is being finalized as we speak. So the selectmen and Mr. Blonde have been going back and forth, and I'm told they are making progress. Again, I'm not in negotiation, so I'm at a loss as far as that goes. Okay. So I know what's going to happen is obviously going to be dependent upon that. I know we heard they were close. Correct. I've heard uh, the same thing. A month thing. ago. I've heard the same thing. But uh, I don't think it's final, though I believe it's imminent. Okay. And that's something that has to happen to make... Correct. For any of this to be relevant. All right. Are there any obstacles? I mean, it seems to be... It's just a resolution, as Bob said, of where, like, the mooring balls and the things that right now he rightly... He's got a limited footprint there. It's a small site. Of where does he put that? You know, so he's giving up some access. He has to allow public access, but he doesn't have to allow it to the extent we're looking to have in order to have this go across his property in the rear there. Weren't they proposed to be on the float that would be... And that's kind there. of what they're working out. And, I, and hopefully that... That it, that's a, to me a reasonable solution, and that's what as, they're working on. As a normal on. project manager, it's a great joy to <laughs> watch you work. It's amazing. Okay. Well, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, it's always concerning. nice to watch somebody else work. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of do this for a living. So I mean, it was concerning that I mean, two years ago, this was like ready to go, and um, and you know, it's just a, it's like, well, what's happening? Because why this person supposedly wanted this it was going to be good for business, and now this. The project's been tied up. I mean, it's some, you know, it's it, it doesn't seem like, like I don't understand what's going on, like why we're sitting on, and the price keeps going up, so it's costing the town more and more money. I, I agree. I mean, I think part of it was, if anyone remembers the town meeting last year, there was some talk of doing something by Iron Horse Park initially, of uh, that's giving them a storage area there, and that really didn't go over particularly well. So that's kind of been the reason for this past year of saying, look, we got to come up with an alternative. I think one or two of the selectmen really weren't happy with that uh, alternative. And you've got two selectmen who are new since we went to town meeting uh, out of three. And I'm not saying that's the reason, but it, it adds to the fact that everyone's going get, to get on board again. I'm hoping that it is all resolved shortly. I, I'm frustrated. As, the, trust me, I hear it from my committee all the time of, mm -hmm. like, yeah. when is this going to happen? And there uh, are really two distinct businesses, right? The Red Eye Roasters is distinct from the Mariner, is it not? It, it is, but it, he's, a tenant, think, he's a tenant of... Uh, I think what was good for business was basically the Red Eye Roasters, right? Uh, but the Mr. Bond, who runs the uh, Marina... But uh, I mean, and the other a, thing I've heard... It's I mean, a different issue. People have commented to me, like, oh, so are we still building that bridge to nowhere <laughs> um, as kind of a joke. Oh, and I know. I've heard it many a time. Yeah, so I mean, it's just concerning because then once you get over there, I don't know if there's any, pl I mean, there's nothing there, I mean, it, relatively speaking, and so I'm, I'm just not quite sure what the draw is for people other than to get around a signal box, I mean, to spend $300,000 to avoid walking around a, something on a sidewalk. But I, I think if you look at the, um, the Boston Harbor Walk, I mean, to me, in the big scale of things, 300000 it, it's significant money, but it's not so much that in terms of what its impact is, and I agree, you could still get there. I've, I've heard the same argument from the FOSS committee. People on that said, no one's going to go there. Yeah. Um, people said that about the Boston Harbor Walk, too, before it was done. And you do it, and we've only got eight-tenths of a mile. I'm not trying to compare us to, to the city of Boston. I was going to say, there's, 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 a, there's a significant difference. But there's a combination of public and private properties that they cross. You know, um, I used to be a, uh, on a, a member of the Boston Harbor Association, so I'm kind of aware of that. And I think in our own small way, it, it's somewhat similar. And if you really walk along and you're trying to get a fairly peaceful experience, let's say I'm at Town Pier or I'm at the Bathing <coughs> Beach and I want to go to Whitney Wharf, trust me, you'll lose it when you get in front of Three Otis. Uh, right, Three I Otis guess Street. my question is why would you go to Whitney Wharf in the first place? But I think you will from Town Pier. The problem is it is an island right now. So very few people go to Whitney Wharf. I think you're going to get more, and th there's going to be a significant, um, hopefully, the FOSS committee is going to raise some funds, or the town meeting will help appropriate some, or we'll raise some privately, to do a memorial for FOSS at the Veterans Park. So again, and then there is, as many of you are aware, there's a lot of talk about doing things at the Lincoln Maritime, that, you know, a study has been done to improve the facilities there. There's limited <coughs> parking there. You know, so some of the kids who actually, you know, go to Lincoln uh, Maritime and sail or row there, park at Town Pier. So it isn't the bridge to nowhere to them. I mean, if they don't have to walk around the front of 3 uh, Otis Street and can walk through Whitney Wharf and through the Veterans Park and in a safer way get to Lincoln Maritime, I, I think that's worth something. The proposed uh, Frost Memorial is on the uh, front page of the journal this week, too. It's a pretty handsome structure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Catherine, if you're trying to take a walk along the shore, you know, yeah. from, from uh, Rocky Beach all the way down to the uh, 
it, it is frustrating that something come upon an obstacle. And, and the old proposal, the one that bridge right up against the sidewalk, seemed like a, just a token, and, and that's gone. And, and people moving through a public space and, and liven it. You know, some might be walking through it on their way to the uh, swimming club. Some of us might be walking in there well, and sitting in the door. <coughs> it'll, it'll build up. Just one of the uh, things that we've been looking at in the planning board and the master planning uh, outreach hearings that we've had mm -hmm. uh, in response to the original questionnaire, and it came up very high uh, as a priority on the questionnaire, access to and essentially development of the waterfront opportunity as a recreation and open space, kind of a series of connected spaces, and also the access to that. Um, to and through. To and through. Point. And I'm thinking that, you know, we're looking at this in, in the context of three Otis and that right. subset of the overall plan, and I'm wondering if should we t take this and put it into the overall plan that's currently been developed, mm -hmm. the, the, the illustration that we've seen as to the opportunities and what the connectivity will be? Because I think if, if it's only looked at as a subset, mm -hmm. people have a different sense of what it is. But if it's looked at as part of the connectedness on the waterfront, maybe that would explain better the validity of the proposal. It's just a suggestion. No, I, I agree. And uh, we've actually, the Harbor Development Committee has met with the Shade Tree Committee, and we actually went through a number of different things of what you could do along the whole waterfront for that connectivity thing that, you know, the landscaping was never looked at uh, in total. Uh, a lot of these parcels were looked at piecemeal. Uh, so the idea that you're looking at it as I'm going from, again, it's only eight-tenths of a mile, and uh, D.J. McKinnon's study for the you know, improving the Lincoln Maritime thing talks about eventually hopefully getting rid of the rotary. Now, that may or may not happen. That's the other bad spot right now, quite honestly. If you, anyone happens to walk around that, there's a guardrail, and the area you can walk on is about as narrow as what it is in front of Three Otis, and people in vehicles are going as fast around it as they can. So we do have a couple of choke points, and I think you look at them. To me, this is in the, it's in the middle of that whole area. This is almost dead center. If you go from the bathing beach to, uh, to Steamboat right. Wharf, this is about dead center. You know? So I, I think in some ways it's the anchor to pull all that together. Uh, our own surveys have indicated that uh, the respondents from uh, citizen, citizen Ray of Hingham have indicated the highest priority for waterfront use of CPA uh, funds. I, I think too, so. I think this bridge to me is a draw in itself. Yeah. I mean, the, the bridge that's at World's End is a, it's really a great thing to walk over. Sure. And these, these bridges, I mean, I've had projects that we've done these before, and it's really enjoyable to, to walk over them because they're very open and you get a great view of the water. And so I think just the bridge itself may be a draw, and then that draws you to a park that I think Motivation hopefully will be even more beautiful when they're, when the memorial goes in and landscape is, is done down the road. And well, to stand on or just not, even if you're just, just on it. Yeah, just to stand there. Maybe there are benches on uh, right. a and few places that you can and see. And the load is going to account for July 4th. So, you know, somebody watching the fireworks, oh, yeah, you know. And, e yeah. and that may be the first Perfect. time somebody figures it out, you know. Yeah. And uh, the one time that, you know, the whole harbor is mobbed, but maybe they realize, gee, this isn't so bad, and they come back some other time. And I, I think that's <laughs> what the idea is. And same thing with lighting and landscaping. <coughs> you know, I, we don't always have any lighting along the harbor either. Uh, not that it has to be overlit, but we almost have no lighting, you know, so would, it... Would the smell fisher persons use it too? <laughs> yeah, you probably could, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Any uh, further comments yeah. from the committee? Because we had a citizen that wanted to speak, I think. Oh, yeah, sure. Development Committee. Um, I've been on the committee almost three years now, and um, I have learned an enormous amount in those three years. Uh, if I wanted to pat three people on the back, it would be Alan, Ken Kors, and our Harbor Master, and T.J. McKinnon, who's putting his own money in, thousands of dollars to do what he's doing for the sailing club at that end of the harbor. This walkway, what we hope to have someday, is a walkway from the beach to Steamboat. And this bridge is the connecting piece. It's as simple as that. Um, two years ago, UMass Amherst Boston Marine Division, and I can't think of the exact department, did an, a wonderful study, <coughs> excuse me, on the uh, amount of income uh, uh, money generated by an active seacoast. Uh, Marine, we have one of the best towns in the southeastern Mass area with all our boat dealerships out on 3A. Two months ago, 
The Associated Press did almost an identical article and upped the ante to 1.1 billion on the eastern seacoast of just boaters, just boaters, fishing, what they spend, what they buy, how they have things repaired. There's an enormous amount of economy on our seacoast that we just don't realize until you see that it's kind of hidden unless it's brought out in an article like that. Um, and we're a seacoast community. And we have really done not much to keep ourselves in a pristine, we, we have so much down there that could look so nice and be so nice if we are willing to spend the money. And personally, I, Alan and I, he knows, I have uh, spoken with Senator Bradley's office <coughs> recently, and I hope to meet with him again next week. Um, but the governor put in a $120 million bond bill <coughs> last April, and it went to um, the Environmental Natural Resources Agricultural Committee and for hearings of which Senator Hedlund is one of the members. <coughs> so we have a little contact there. This bill is uh, 120 million, uh, 18 million is just for seacoast design, construction, reconstruction, rehabilitation, navigated coastal well waterways, inland waterways, et cetera, et cetera. And then 18 million of that is to go to the Department of Fish and Game for things such as coast, uh, Studies, engineering, services, initial activities, planning, design, construction, repair, existing facilities, control department, fish and game. There's a lot of money there. And I personally would like to just see our two representatives go after it, get a little input from us. And as Alan said, if we put some money in as a town, I think it'll be much easier to get money from the state. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Any <coughs> further comment, questions? I don't know if you've gotten around to this discussion, but um, someone's been asking me, what about fishing and things? Would you be able to fish from that pier or jump from the pier? I'm sure at high tide with kids. I don't know how much you're going to catch. In terms of the there is an alcohol pipe that's fairly close to it, but, you know. It's just fun to throw the kite in. Well, when they open the fish, there's a picture of people sitting out of one of the docks. It's not fishing season. Yeah. It's not going to be a hike that would prohibit that. I was told that back back in the day that was there was definitely a fish. Is it being constructed well, yeah. in pieces or is it delivered in the That's a good question. Um, I know Bob wants to be brief. It, it actually the, the way this is designed is it's designed from land, so it is uh, done. There's a pretty good span in the middle, so you would do some of it from the Three Otis Street side. You do the other thing. It's the way they did it. It's telling us the World's End Bridge was done that way. So it allows you to be more cost effective instead of having to stage it from the marine side. You do it, you stage it from the land. So whatever piles you have to set, you set from there and then you were able to pick it and place it. Actually the, the fish question was a great segue to the Boy Scout land, which is yeah. our which is our next article. Our next yeah, move along. That's good. We've seen great uh, pictures of uh, cold water trout and the yeah. streams and so, George, could you bring us up to date? I will. Um, let me start by giving you an update. Uh, give me a copy for everybody. Um, uh, it's, a, uh, it's an update. Thank you, Alan. Uh, it's an update on the price of the property. and. Uh, you know, it, uh, it incorporates some additional fees and, and uh, anticipated costs that have been provided to us by Abby Pearsall. So I thought I would uh, bring the group up to date on, uh, on what the expected total cost of the project would be. Um, and we can discuss those fees in, uh, in just a few seconds. Uh, but first of all, uh, good evening, and, uh, and thank you for the opportunity to address this, this uh, committee. Uh, to discuss our proposal. Uh, we do believe that this is an excellent opportunity for the town to purchase uh, a nice piece of land um, in the Liberty Pole section of town. Uh, we think um, it's a very valid value proposition for the town. Uh, price, even, a, even with the additional uh, funds added in, I think is very reasonable. And I think the, uh, the project and, and the piece of land is consistent with the, uh, with the tenants of the Community Preservation Act. Uh, so I, I will be brief, but uh, let me just go over uh, a little bit of the history of, of this project um, and this proposal. Uh, what we're talking about is a piece of, uh, of open space land, about six acres, uh, in the Liberty Pole section of town. Uh, 
the land does abut, does abut excuse me, <coughs> existing uh, conservation land, the uh, <coughs> R- River Reservation, uh, which is about seven acres. So if the town were to purchase this piece of land, we would essentially be doubling the size of the Eel uh, Reservation. Thank you. Um, uh, the property is, um, is accessible um, via a right-of-way. The right-of-way is fairly narrow. It runs between two houses, and the Eel River um, basically bisects the, uh, the right-of-way. So, so access to the property is really um, best obtained by going through the existing um, Eel River Reservation and then simply crossing over that property, the town property, into, this, uh, into the Boy Scout land. Uh, so there is um, there's plenty of accessibility for the property. Um, in terms of uh, just the his- history of the property, um, the land was uh, was given to the Boy Scouts um, in the in the will of Winthrop Cushing in 1953. Uh, the Cushings acquired the property in uh, December of 1861, um, and as I say, they deeded it to the Boy Scouts in uh, in uh, 1953. At the time they deeded the property, they also set up a trust uh, to administer the property for the benefit of the Boy Scouts. It's the Eel River Field Trust. Uh, the trustees uh, endorse uh, our proposal to, uh, to sell the land to the, uh, to the town. And if the town does go ahead and purchase the property, the proceeds of the money, as outlined in the will, would be again controlled by the, by the trustees uh, for the benefit of the troop, so the troop would, the troop would have access to the income generated by the funds, but not necessarily to the principal itself. So the will co- <coughs> contemplated the ability of the trustees to actually sell the land That's for the benefit of the Boy Scouts. That's correct. Okay. Correct. And and to deal with that money on an ongoing basis, so the scouts do continue to benefit. Uh, the troop, uh, the troop did use the property up into the 1970s um, as a as a camping area. Uh, the uh, one of the uh, one of the existing trustees and, and the abutter um, is uh, Donald Greeley. He was a scoutmaster at the time. Um, his uh, son was uh, was one of the scouts <coughs> in the troop, so they basically camped in their backyard. Um, one of the other trustees at the time was Bernie Gregoire. He had two sons who were also um, Eagle Scouts through the troop, and so they uh, they, uh, they have shared some uh, some stories with me of experiences uh, camping on the property. And uh, and as with with many a Boy Scout camping trip, it rains, and, uh, <laughs> and so there are, there are some pleasant memories from those events. Uh, the Scouts uh, have not used the property in a number of years. Um, as those of you who have walked the property with me. No, it is it's pretty much overgrown at this point. So, so whatever trails and campsites uh, the scouts had constructed have really been overgrown. Uh, those trails uh, again could could be readily resurrected, um, as well as uh, you know, it, trails could be created in the Eel River Reservation to make access to the property a lot uh, a lot easier for so people. Are those potential Eagle Scout projects? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah absolutely. Um, so. Um, in terms of um, in terms of you know why we feel this is a, a valuable piece of property um, and, and a good deal for the for the town, um, the Eel River does flow through the property. Uh, as you pointed out, Bob, it is um, there's abundant fish and wildlife in there, um, uh, or at least there have been some documented fish that live in the in the stream. Um, it is a cold cold water stream, which, as I understand it, is the sole remaining cold water stream in the town. Uh, and the Eel River does um, does feed into the town water supply, um, um, and um, and is um, as I think Abby has pointed out, it's uh, it's the property is within a zone two wellhead, so uh, so there is some uh, some certainly some significance to the property and um, some value to the town in the point. <coughs> Um, I, the handout I gave you does incorporate some additional fees um, that Abby provided to us. Um, um, I think these are probably somewhat estimates, uh, probably reasonable estimates, so the number <coughs> may be a little bit less. Has, um, has the appraisal been done? Yes, the appraisal was done. The appraisal was done, and, and the document has been provided to the members of the committee. Um, so the appraisal came in at $30,000, which is a little less than what the town has it on the books for. <laughs> um, and and uh, 
the scouts paid the, uh, it was a $500 appraisal fee, which the scouts had paid for, uh, and, uh, and we would ask for that to be uh, incorporated in the price paid back to us. Okay, and I think we're familiar with the nature of the other costs as being necessary to almost any open space acquisition. And uh, I know there's one nagging title question that yeah. we're going to look into a little bit further before next week. Uh, and hopefully um, that won't be anything that is insurmountable. Okay. Any questions? Um, and maybe this question of the Open Space Committee or, or um, Boy Scouts. Uh, how do the people in that uh, part of Liberty Poll uh, feel about this? Uh, I, I only know uh, as a South School parent and knowing one of the neighbors who uh, had asked me, um, you know, A, what's going on there, and B, will this, uh, if the town were to acquire this and, and adjoin, you know, there'd be adjoining land. Mm -hmm. um, uh, what would that mean in terms of uh, access and cars and parking and whatever to that part of Liberty Pole? And I don't know if that's come up with the Open Space Committee, with Conservation, or with you, and whether anybody has said anything and, and to you about that. Uh, it's a good question. Nobody has raised, the, raised that question with us. Um, uh, has, uh, I would certainly think it's a consideration. Um, there is existing seven acres of land um, that is town owned, um, that does not get a whole lot of use. <coughs> it looks like it's, um, you know, certainly a, people have, uh, have dropped their, uh, their yard waste there. Um, so um, so there, there, there is existing land, it's not really utilized right now. Um, but certainly uh, I, I, I would hope that, that one of the goals of, of acquiring this land would be that it would become more usable, more accessible for people. Um, because it is a nice, um, you know, conceivably 14-acre piece of land in the middle of Liberty Pole. Do the access points go pretty close to houses? When we, when we walked it, we, we were around one very impressive house and yard. Yeah. So I couldn't tell if that was the... That's the right of way. The, so if we, where we parked the cars yeah. on uh, Brewster Drive, <coughs> that, that's really where the access would be. I don't believe there's any other access to the existing town conservation land other than off of Booster Drive. Which, which has always been an informal access? Correct. Right. Do you, Abby, have a vision, for, or the Open States Committee have a vision of what this property could be used for? <coughs> I mean the combined property, because that, that scale I think there are certainly some opportunities, again, we sort of talked about linking up sort of the overgrown trails and kind of clearing that area out a little bit and, and providing, opening it up for, um, for access. I think there's especially um, being able to bring folks into the Eel River area, understand cold water fisheries a little bit better and have sort of an educational opportunity, things like nature walks and, and those types of activities. So there could be, you know, some more organized pieces <coughs> around that once it opens up. So I think certainly working with the scouts or other interested volunteers um, to sort of make it more accessible and then you know I think it would probably similarly manage to other conservation properties with, with trails on them so I guess we're waiting for the trail plan yeah we're trail waiting trail for the trail plan <laughs> <Exactly. laughs> <Yeah. laughs> do either of the properties have uh, access from Cushing Street I believe it abuts Cushing Street there's not a defined trail access as far as, as, far as I'm aware and I don't know if anybody else has, has found one <laughs> I have not um, so you could get in but we would need to construct something that was a little bit more defined for folks, otherwise it's just kind of walking off the edge of the road. I thought it was, was landlocked on that side. Uh, yeah, it it, it may be, I'm not sure what the ownership is, right adjacent. So but there is, a, there is a sign along Cushing Street, it's this Eel River Reservation. It's a different, I think it's a different property. It doesn't seem to be property. close, but no, that's the land it's trust. a conservation. Oh, and the downside. Eel River Woods, I think it's there. Us. It's different. I think it's different. I believe yeah, I so. how we'll, we'll have to, I'll have to take a look. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're talking about different pieces. Open space. The, what the sign is. Yeah, I just know the Eel River. I'm just wondering. There must be some connection here. Yeah. But, there, but there is a trail there. That one does, yes. Yeah. As, as so I'm just wondering. I've never been down that trail. I'm just curious. Does it, could you ever access? 
I think I would have to look into sort of where the connection, connection points are there. I'm not entirely sure right now. Bobby, you're looking for it? I have it right here. If you're looking for something, I have it here. I can't read it. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I think one of the things that's important with the health plan with other with the management of the conservation lands is to come up with a unified signage um, sort of system so folks can understand not just sort of the monument signs that we have today, but also, you know, here's part of a specific trail network that people can kind of brand and identify with. So certainly that's something that we'd be looking to do. Another question I have is in terms of the um, cold water stream, is it herring and trout that are in the canal? I believe it's trout. Trout that are in the canal. As part of this combination of these two parcels, would there be um, resources to basically foster and protect, you know, that that stream and that fishery for, you know, just in terms of uh, protections? I don't know what kind of. Right now, it's just sort of head there. But is there anything needed to further protect that? So that is the problem. I don't know if there's anything additional needed in terms of physical alteration other than sort of opening it up and using it as an educational resource for folks. I think that's probably the best conservation opportunity is to make sure um, that both, you know, general residents and, and, you know, kids in town and are able to kind of access and see what these areas look like and kind of connect at a more personal level to these habitats. Thanks, Abby. Babe? Do the fishing bylaws <laughs> but then they'll be gone. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah, I love the story of the kids, uh, the kids like, going down. I am not terribly familiar with the fishing bylaws, so it's something I would have to take a look at because it's not something I've been involved with yet in town. Um, but I can certainly look into it. <laughs> Maybe Faith knows the answer to a question. My husband would. They're pretty small. Yeah. <laughs> they, not a prize nice. trophy. Any further comments, questions, members of the public? Thank you. I, I just think the time has come. You know, we discussed this over several well, cycles. It's a modest cost, well located. You know, there's a good deal of awareness about relationship with the neighbors, and it's time to do it. I think we thought it was a very attractive project that we'd like to do last year. We just didn't have enough money, and this could be the year. <laughs> All right. Thanks for the fame Thank elections. You. Thank you. So then we have 149 Rockland <coughs> Street. Uh, who's going to present? Mr. Barbudo, are you going to present on this, or Jim, or? <coughs> Good evening. Good evening. Welcome. I'm I'm Bob Curley. Oh, okay. Uh, we had a meeting uh, here in the, the setup, uh, and uh, w there was uh, four proposals uh, uh, given to us at that time, and uh, we don't accept any of those. Uh, we, we initially we put in for uh, four hundred ninety-nine thousand on this for the whole property. Uh, we will take four hundred thousand, and that's that's our uh, that's our offer. Uh, I believe it's worth that much, and uh, uh, anything lower than that, uh, you know, at this time, if the committee doesn't have enough funds, well, we will pass, but uh, uh, wait for another year. But uh, that, that's what uh, that's what we're asking for. It. I I've received just informal information recently, but it's my understanding that there has been an appraisal that. Came in at two hundred and fifty thousand. It's not a. Is somebody? Somebody want to address that? Jim? It's 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 not a formal appraisal. We decided to hold off on appraisals until we made our decisions on which properties to go forward with. But it's a it's called a broker's cost of or opinion of cost. Right. Mm -hmm. And that did come in at that much lower figure, which is what Tony's referring to is what he found to be basically unacceptable. Uh, do, do you have any competing appraisals, Mr. Barbuda? Uh, not at this time, no. Uh, 
we just, uh, you know, we just uh, let it out at this time to, you know, to, to sell it. But uh, we haven't had any other offers uh, up to now. I understand that there were some alternative proposals as well that would uh, permit the town to acquire the area along the, uh, the river, but still uh, leave you with a buildable lot that would perhaps be a win-win situation? That's right. That's That was one of the options that we discussed. So of the various options that... The and that keep, I keep part of the land. It, it seems to me that the value of the land is in the buildable lot, and that um, to the extent that <laughs> The town can acquire the land along the river. Whoever might choose to build there would still have the benefit of the land, wouldn't have to pay taxes on it, and the town might have a desirable piece of conservation land. It's been quite balanced. The value that's of the, a, is, is the riverside. Edge. That's, that's kind of a hard lot to build on. I mean, it's mostly low land, and the only thing you could build on uh, is up on that rock. And to, to build a house up on that rock, it costs thousands and thousands of dollars to blast. And it, it wouldn't be worth it, I, not, not for a person like me. I mean, you'd have to have a millionaire, a multi-millionaire to, to build a house here. You know? yeah. maybe, maybe I can say a few words. Please, yeah. Please, yeah. Um, so we, this is Jim Morris with the Open Space Committee. So we. We did present a few options, and that was an option to subdivide the property such that there would be a buildable portion that would they'd retain title, the Barbudas would retain title to, and then the other portion that is very attractive from an environmental point of view would go to the town or could potentially also have a restriction. There are a few ways to go about that. But the, the family position is, is very clear on this that they see more value than the town is finding through the opinion of cost. And that, that's something that, that's difficult for us to overcome. Um, I can say this, so of the properties that the Open Space Committee <coughs> had reviewed in this past year, and we had seven properties, um, I think it was seven properties taking out Whiting Street, we, uh, we felt this one was the strongest of all the properties in terms of its value to, to open space um, and, and protection. So, and it really is, it, it's got a huge appeal because of its location, of where it is, sits in terms of other properties that we've managed to, to acquire, the Noonan property, the Monty property. It's right in a, in a really nice place. Um, and it could be that it's worth our time to take a careful look at this opinion of cost and see whether or not it's, it's accurate. We felt that it, it, it's probably pretty good because it comes in in line with what we saw in terms of value for the Noonan. Um, it's not far away from that. But Mr. Barbuda's position is very clear. He really doesn't want to go below. He already has come down from 499 to 400. He doesn't want to go much below that. Um, well, we um, are not able to recommend purchasing land for less than uh, fair appraised value, right. nor would we ever get the support of the advisory committee or the board of selectmen for doing so, um, e even if we uh, went off the reservation. Right. So if it, it seems to me that Sure, there's always some leeway with respect to appraisals that uh, I'd be delighted to see maybe something more formal if uh, someone thinks that there's an issue with the broker's opinion of cost. But even from what Mr. Barbudo said about it sounds like it's a hard place to build that would cost a lot of money, um, you're looking for that one right person that, uh, you know, it might be worth more money than uh, the most people in the market would be willing to pay. Yeah. So is the only that you described at the top the only place that one could actually build a house? Uh, yes, according to uh, uh, Cliff Prentice, I had him over there uh, last year, I believe it was uh, the year before. Mm -hmm. and, uh, Cliff uh, Prentice. Uh, Prentice, 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 the former right, right. uh, uh, conservation, conservation officer. officer. 
uh, he was over to look at it. I asked him, I uh, asked his opinion to see where it could be built. And uh, we walked down that road, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with that, we walked down the road, he says, you can build on top of that rock. There's no. not enough level land left over. Yeah. Well, that's, that's the only path that's built. Well, we, we, had, we had done a uh, look at this, and the drawings that you have um, in front of you, the, there's this, this schematic that has a white section that's, that's cut out of it. So you can see the outline. I'm sorry I don't have this blown up, but you can see the outline of the, of the, of the property, the four acres, right, um, going into the Weir River. And then this, this, um, you know, this white area is a portion of the property that could be carved out as a potentially, quote unquote, potentially buildable portion. That's, that comes out just a little bit over an acre. Um, that, that's where the value in terms of, of uh, buildable land sits. So if the opinion of cost was accurate, plus or minus a bit, most of the value sits in that, that white space. Did the opinion of cost reflect the subdivision of this where you have the buildable parcel and the open space parcel, or was it just for the it overall? It was overall. It's for the overall par parcel in blue or yeah, green. Blue or outline, blue or green outline that's shown in the drawing. The so overall, yeah, so the four if acres. One, if, the, uh, if the town were to purchase just the area that is along the river, right, the river, well, which would be part of the connected open space parcels along that river, and to me that's where the value to the, to the town is. conservation yeah. is and the connectivity, what would that would that portion of the property be available only without this piece, without the buildable lot, and what would the value of that be? That's something that we don't have a, a, a clear number <coughs> on. It would be a, a fraction, of, a, a small fraction of the 250. Yeah. A, a, the smaller fraction of the 250. I'm wondering, is that an option? I don't know. I mean, I, this is a question maybe for you, General, for Abby. Uh, the River Protection Act and the wetland delineation, I mean, is there, I'm looking here with the, I don't quite understand the purple and the pinkish line, is that those, those delineations indicate an area that is not buildable? The, yes. This, the, the pink line, the 150 foot yes. wetland bu buffer? Yeah, so this is the rear river. Is there some delineation on this map that is not yeah. buildable? There are. So some of, as you're looking through here, and it looks like the riverfront <coughs> area is, is kind of hard to see on the printout. It's a hash mark area. Um, the easiest resource areas, and again, these are taken off of mass GIS, and then the, the buffers are sort of done off of those boundaries in, in the mapping program. So they haven't been actually delineated, so these boundaries may actually change once somebody gets down there. But from the aerial images, they're fairly consistent with what I would expect to see from a, an actual delineation. The wetland is sort of, you can see, sort of the green stippled area. The riverfront area, um, there's a blue hash mark that's fairly faint. There, that's um, a 200-foot area around the, the mean high water of the bank of the river that is a, that is a protected area. Up to that purple line, that 50-foot uh, buffer to the wetland resource, the commission has a very strict prohibition on alteration within that 50-foot buffer area. So that part is essentially undevelopable. The area in the pink is the 100-foot buffer to the wetland. Um, that has oversight from the Conservation Commission, but it's, there, are, I, there are things you can do in that area up to a certain point. The commission would weigh in based on a, on a notice of intent um, to determine what could be done and what portions of a project would be permitted. And is that hilly, is that hilly area somewhere in that purple? <laughs> the, no, the hill is actually, you can sort of see, um, it bit, starts between the purple and the pink. If that makes sense. Okay. Put that out of it. Thanks. Well, the rocks. You can see, yeah, you can see rock the rocks. Yeah, you can see the rock where Cliff Prentice said uh, you could build something. No, right here. That's the rock where we almost. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's what I did. Okay. <laughs> Trying to find out where that was. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Is this, it, it says FEMA. I mean, is that flood? There's right. two pieces. On the other map, there's two pieces. One yeah. is the oh, FEMA 100 year floodplain. Yeah. That's in sort of the tannish color. Um, and that's a, an AE zone. The other piece um, is the Weir River Area of Critical Environmental Concern, which has some, some higher state oversights um, and certainly factors into anything that would be built 
in that pink area would get a very significant look by the Conservation Commission because of its proximity to the river um, and wanting to protect those water resources and habitat. But it's on the back side, right, in terms of the ridge? It is. It's if you're looking, if you're standing, you know, on Rockland Street, um, looking at the, the ridge coming up, the, the area of critical environmental concern actually stops below that ridge. Well, if this white area were brought over to include a rock, mm -hmm. <coughs> it, it would, could. Would, would that be something that would make a difference to you, Mr. Barbudo? If this buildable lot, so if, it, if we're talking about dividing the, the property into two pieces, <coughs> if this came over here more, so you had more of that high ground, and then the town were to purchase something on this side, would that be something that works better for you? Okay. So the, the okay. interest is, is keeping right. the entire parcel together. All right. Well, I. I think I speak on behalf of everybody. We greatly appreciate you bringing this to our attention this year. Uh, wish the appraisal were different. We'd be happy to look at something before we vote next week. If anything changes, um, we'd be delighted to have you come back before us next week. Um, Mr. Morris has done a great job in working with you. Uh, you you've been wonderful people that show us your land. And, it's a, it's a great piece of property in a very uh, environmentally sensitive area. We'd, uh, we'd love to be able to work with you uh, to preserve this for the Kingdom community if there's a way to do it. And I think if you look at Would everybody it, agree with that? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. If there's any chance that this buildable area is buildable, then they win win possibility is there. Okay. Well, but uh, we heard a price from the owner that is different from what we conceive would an appraisal would support. I mean, I think we're constrained. I mean, you agree, Lucy, from the advisory committee perspective, constrained by uh, what the appraised value is. Yes, and more than the appraised value. Right. So, mm -hmm. right. the only out really is whether or not that, that opinion cost is true. That opinion seems so low for such a site. There's that Somebody paid three we, have seen, we have seen a swing in, in these, these appraisals. Um, it may be worth doing this properly. With an actual appraisal. Yeah. <coughs> I mean, is that something that could be what? done within the next week? No. Probably not in the next week. I don't but I, I, could I just weigh in here too? Because um, up until tonight, I was still hopeful that even though these numbers were disappointing to you, that that's that is that is the reality of what the appraisal will come back at. But if your figure is 400 bottom line, then I guess um, my take would be that I, I don't think based. I mean, I, I put some value in this opinion of cost that yeah. that that's, that's going to be too far out of our range yeah, to the point where it, I don't. Yeah, and whether or not another year would even. Yeah bring that anywhere near that number, I, I would be doubtful, but because the building is it's, the uh, it's certainly the nice piece of land. We'd, we'd love to see that. If, if the so-called the rock has, has, has a view, the view of the river then, yeah. right? Yes. Yes. I mean, it, it's very much a scenic. Yes. Right. Yeah. I just know that somebody paid 3 and 30 for my house 15 years ago to tear it down for the view, and it was a 12,000 foot rock. So it's hard to believe that such a site we can go for a lot more than that. I don't, I don't want us to pay more than we have to, but I think the 250 doesn't feel right. I don't know. Pretty spectacular well, view. Uh, and we certainly would. Do you want to continue to try to work with? Well, I think the position is clear and we're pretty far apart. Okay. Um, the way we left it shortly, a little while ago, was to, um, to look at 2015. <coughs> So we can be delighted to see you uh, <laughs> back okay. next year. Okay. Um, if that millionaire okay. doesn't appear <laughs> here soon, and uh, thank you again for uh, working with us this year. Uh, we we hope we can work together for the Hingham community next year. And of course, that isn't really a joke. Millionaires, or multiple millionaires, abound in some neighborhoods, and and they tear houses down to build. I'm, I'm thinking my own experience with Durham and Old Hill. I, I wouldn't underestimate the business that people spend a lot more than that for such a site. And, uh, mm -hmm.
Thank you again, Mr. Public. Is there, is there public sure, would you like uh, anyone for the uh, public and comment? My name is Philip Bleak, and I live at 22 Powers Lane in Hingham, and I'd like to address my uh, comments to the Barbudos. You don't, you don't know me, but you see my home every time you come down Kilby Street, and you're at that T looking north down the river. And at that T on Rockland and Kilby, you see that house at the end of the river. That's my place, okay? I don't represent anyone but myself and a couple of trusts that own some of that property that we do not want to have developed ourselves. And I've had a chance to work with the, to, to sit in these meetings, whether they pertain to me or not, uh, for the last couple of years. And I found that the committee is unable to, to appropriate any funds that go above any of the appraised values, no matter how much you think it's worth your property. They can't do that. I believe they're governed. Uh, by the, the guidelines, or it appears that way to me. So whether you want $2 million or $250,000 and $1, they can't give you more than what the official appraised value is. And I'd love to see this done really well and get a real appraisal for you. I would love to see that property uh, properly appraised. It's going to cost a couple hundred bucks, but if it makes you some money later on, it's a good idea. I'm all in favor for that. I know that the Noonan property just right down the road from last year, went for close to about a 118 to 125,000 an acre. Okay, now that's right on Rockland, and that's a little bit more developable than what yours is for a single family. But there are some, there are some similarities <coughs> with that. And I, I would like to see it, I mean, even consider, because the property that the town's trying to buy isn't worth very much. It's worth a lot to you and me. Because, because we love to look out and see the deer go through there and the hawks fly over. I know this. And the, and the, the 50 egrets that land in there in the springtime. Okay? But to a, to a developer, they could care less because they can't make any money on it because they can't build on it. So consider maybe subdividing and, and keeping the, the property of value, the, the higher land, for you to sell to the, to the, the, the deep pocket person and sell to the, the town Okay, the land that they really need, which is, and what we all want to, to connect the open space, which is a, the less valuable <laughs> land to the developers, but much more valuable to the town as far as green space goes. I, I, I would ask you to reconsider and, and maybe subdivide or at least get the, uh, uh, a better appraisal uh, to, to get this moving, because it, it would be wonderful to have your property uh, as a legacy to the town and uh, to our kids as they go up and down uh, uh, the area up from our place down to Foundry Pond to be able to go across that too. So I appreciate your time. Thank you. I, Thank I, you for your comments. Uh, yeah. uh, are these addressed to the present proposal? Yes. Yep. yes mm -hmm. um, I'm Jennifer Bertner from 16 Powers Lane, and I guess I would like to address it to the Barbudos too. I grew up with the Barbudo mm -hmm. kids. Um, and I think one of the things that we are trying to talk about is we're doing what we're doing on our end of the lane down in this area is the legacy we're leaving. Um, the Amontes and the Barbudas are important families in this town. Um, your land is important, your children are important. Um, what I understand leaving a legacy at this point, we all have to think about money. Um, but one of the nice things about this area is that your name and your history is imprinted forever on this town through a process like this. And it's hard ever to measure that against a market value. I, I have a hard time with this because we put all of our money and all of our resources into saving this every inch of land along that river that we can possibly get a hold of, um, from historic restorations to the environmental conservation. Your piece of land is, in a sense, invaluable to what we're trying to do and what many people in this town see as important. Um, your names are important, and to have those imprinted on something that will never change for this town is really priceless. And I know you need to think about money and think about the future of your family and your children, but this is a different way of thinking about your family and your children and leaving something very important to them. 
Um, and so we would like to work with you in any way possible that we can be supportive to you in doing that and finding a solution. If it's not this year, then next year or the year after. But um, please reach out to us and to this wonderful committee that we've learned to really respect deeply. They look for every solution possible to try to help us find a way of doing what we're trying to do. And it's not always easy the first time around. So uh, all I would do is encourage you to continue working with them rather than just putting things out on the market. Um, they go fast and sometimes things end in a way that we never foresaw or wished. Um, so it's a different kind of legacy. And we'd be, we would, in our trust, would very much like to work with you too and to find a solution that would work for you as well as for the town to have that. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Further comments? Thank you again, Mr. and Mrs. Bogdanov. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Well, then we move forward on our to our housing articles. Uh, Tim. Good evening, folks. Good evening. Thank you, Tim. So folks, I'm Tim White. I'm the chair of the Kingdom Affordable Housing Trust, and I've been before you a couple of times on these three articles. So I'm going to be brief tonight to summarize where we are. Uh, we have two articles, the $175,000 opportunity funding uh, request that uh, we find to be a, uh, a response to reality, and that is that properties in the town come on the market at uh, times that we can't be prepared for unless we have this type of funding available to purchase the property or to create, preserve, and maintain uh, affordable housing in, in town and perhaps to keep it from being developed by uh, uh, a developer. Um, so that's the first article. The second one is the $50,000 uh, flexible discretionary funding. Um, we've had multiple occasions in the past where either the housing authority, the Lincoln School Apartments, or for that matter, the veterans housing was looking for contributions from the trust uh, to assist in, again, creating, preserving, or maintaining affordable housing. Um, we separated the two only so that you folks would have the uh, uh, a good understanding of what we were targeting. And uh, we certainly have no objection to the two being combined and either calling it a flexible uh, account or opportunity funding. The third uh, article is the selectman's article. And that uh, is what I gave you the materials that I gave you uh, just handed out. Um, when we. When I've uh, appeared before you before, a couple of questions came up specifically relating to where we were uh, in the um, subsidized housing inventory list. And the first document that I get, gave to you uh, shows that we are at 6.9%, uh, excuse me, 6.3% according to the state. So we are below the 10%, and what that means is we are susceptible to an unfriendly 40B in this community until we beat that 10%. And that is a darn good reason uh, for our trust to be uh, putting, uh, creating uh, affordable housing uh, on a friendly basis, working with the community, working with the neighbors, <coughs> working with the, uh, the town boards <coughs> to put a product to, that we can all be proud of. The second document that I gave you uh, gives you the breakdown of the uh, uh, the, the town meeting article that, that authorized the, the selectman's parcel uh, indicated that uh, uh, we would be creating property. Uh, housing project will contain anywhere between 20 to 40 affordable dwelling units targeting individuals earning 50%, 80%, 100%, and 120% of the area's median income levels. So that gives you what the uh, 
uh, med the average median income level is for the town of Hamilton. Um, it gives you the, the breakdown um, in the various percentages as well. This is important for us to understand that this essentially becomes a, a mixed development. Um, you might not think of someone earning eighty-five or ninety thousand dollars as being someone who um, uh, is in need of assistance in, in purchasing a home, but in Hingham they are. The prices in Hingham are so high that if you earn eighty thousand dollars a year, you're not going to be afford to live in this area. That's what the state's telling us. The third um, uh, documents that I gave you is a printout of a company that uh, engages in the, exactly these types of developments. I mean, <coughs> the architect on your committee asked us to who might be interested. So I, I did speak with our, our, our consultant, and he gave me this as a perfect example. Uh, there are um, local South Shore housing down in uh, Kingston, another example. but they. The printout simply kind of gives you an idea of the types of projects that, that the nonprofit developers would, would be uh, interested in doing, which is similar to what we're looking to do here. Um, Selectman Lauer isn't here tonight, but she um, was. She's uh, in another room. She yeah. was, she, <laughs> she was in the able building. to uh, track down the transcript. Now, Bob, I don't know whether that could circulate to everybody in the committee. I or believe not, it did, yes. yes. Which I thought was fabulous that we got our hands on that because what that told us is this is that uh, not only was it a, we, we know it was an approved town meeting article that we're, we're, we're working with, but it told us that in, in the, if you took a look at the transcript, that this was a project that was vetted for two years by our predecessor, the Housing Partnership in the town. It, t it t told you that uh, it was a unanimously supported by both the Board of Selectmen and the Advisory Committee. It also was not something that was just read to the town meeting and had a vote. There was significant debate. And a lot of the questions that were raised by this uh, committee were raised at town meeting, including issues relating to traffic, relating to children in the schools, um, relating to whether or not it was a project that was actually viable and in fact, the, the uh, transcript related that there were over a dozen developers that were interested in the project at the time. So I think that that answers most of the questions that I had, had left, been left with by you folks, and I'm more than happy to address anything further with you, but I would respectfully ask you on behalf of our trust that you approve our three articles. Do you, do you know the number of additional affordable units that Hingham needs to have to get? That was a question. I knew that was one of the questions, and I did not get the answer to that. To get to 10 percent, I, yeah. I got my phone well, out, and I was going to try to do a calculation. Yeah, that's what, that's what you, technically, you could but, do that. I mean, yeah. you have well, you need 880, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. You need 880. I comment on that if I could. Currently, the zoning board, zoning board, do not agree that we are under the 10 percent. Mm -hmm. All of the applications that we have received, we have submitted an appeal to the uh, state for review. Um, and this goes back to um, Linden Ponds. Linden Ponds was permitted on the basis <coughs> that the units in Linden Ponds would be counted towards the affordable housing percentage. Um, every application that we submit that every application that comes in front of us on 40B that we basically appeal to the state because we feel that we have met it. The ground rules have changed subsequent to the approval of the fund. So the position of the boards in the town is that we're, at, we're actually at about 11 or 12 percent affordable housing units. Now that doesn't say that, you know, the boards are not favorable to a proactive need, you know, methodology of producing affordable housing opportunities but I just wanted to make that clear that that's, that and that's a good point that's the, town's, the, the board's position is that we don't agree with the state that, that's a very good point and in fact when we appeared before the zoning board that, that for our 40b they that was exactly what the, the committee said that the, the, the ZBA said is that just understand that our position is that we, we believe we have our 10 percent. The town is going to say that and stand by that until such time as perhaps the, like the recreation drive development had that gone forward that probably would have been the uh, 
the ultimate challenge. I, I think it's a case where there isn't unanimity. As you remember, the, the uh, planning board sued against the ZBA for the initial comprehensive permit, and DHCD is an initial response that there should not have been a comprehensive permit. And then that evolved into saying they would come up with water. And it's, uh, you know, I mean, this isn't really the subject, but you, you look at the fact that you need a couple of thousand dollars in your suitcase to knock on the door and then bonds isn't the usual 80% of the, of the mean income earning person. And they've been instructed to advertise loudly and clearly that they have some subsidy money available. And I, took, I taught an ad two days ago, come see Lyndon Plant, not a word about it. it didn't, anyway, anyway, it's not, it's debatable, but the I other, the other two I, grounds. The other comment that I would also have is, is that I think in terms of the master plan discussions that we've been involved with, we'd also like to see an affordable housing opportunity presented, but one that's presented in a density that is consistent with the fabric of the town. And I think that um, consistent doesn't mean carbon copy, but consistent such that a lot of the proposals that we've had have proposed a density that's 14 times approximately what's currently allowable as a density. And I think that where that can be problematic is you know, just how urban do these buildings look? Now, for example, I, I'm not wild about this kind of approach in areas of the town where it would be inappropriate, but that doesn't mean that there aren't clusters zoning kinds of of the project developments that would be consistent with the density in the town, but would also increase the open space around. So I'm just thinking, you know, in That's terms of this proposal, these applications, we're not really looking at no. This kind of a no, I, that, that's the yeah. website. No, yeah, As, in, in fact, we're we're we are absolutely not. Um, <coughs> at one of the earlier meetings, I did bring in. I think I actually still have the, the plan uh, in my file back there. Where we we're looking at, at two fam, basically two uh, two units two together units, yes. here, uh, and that's it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's good, and that's the beauty of this. You know, if you f folks award us this funding, it gives us the ability to control that. It gives yeah. us the ability to select the development that we like the best, that we think fits the fabric of the community best. But where's the drive for this for? I mean, I, I've expressed my concerns before, so I won't go through them. I mean, they, they highlight them as it's concentrating lower income people in the woods. Um, why, you know, as opposed to it seemed like the philosophy has been is to be sort of mix it in so no one is, it, the, the arrow isn't pointing to this is where the poor people live. So they, why are we going from what's going on in Beale Street now, we're one out, I mean, two out of eight. Now we're going all 40 of them are all low income housing. You know, what's the driver for that? It's not gonna put us over the top. And maybe if it was putting us over the top, there's a value there, but we're not going over the top. We're hundreds of units away. So I'm not sure what, <coughs> what the motivation is, maybe to share that with folks. Sure, I, I think that it, to, to say that this is going to be an area of just low income people, flies in the face of the material I gave you today. Right. Yeah, it's really yeah. affordable You look at that second printout. But how much are the houses going to, the uh, buildings going for? Well, that it depends. Well, but. I mean, depends. I mean, you must have, I mean, no, is no. It, are they going to be no, 80,000, no, no. 100,000, 200? No, it's restricted, it's restricted by, by the state as to what they can, what, what, what the cost can be. That's the whole, that's the whole beauty of that. And these are sale, uh, for sale these or sales. rent? These are the sales. These are sales. Okay. These are all sales. But you look at the, you look at that second chart, and if the, you're telling me that that represents the, um, the poor, it's a mix. That's the beauty of it. It's a mix. Well, as someone who's making a family of three that are making $42,000 a year, that's are they right. able to pay mortgage? No, it's tax? 80. It's 80 to 120, right? Well, I'm looking at, well, no, I'm no, looking no. at the 50%. But it's 50, 80, 100, and 120. Right. So somebody oh, that's, that's the mix. So, oh, okay. So that's two people mix. making $37,000 are going to be able to buy a house, qualify for a mortgage, pay taxes, and upkeep on $37,000 a year and have kids. Address them. Well, Tim, isn't it right? But the, the prices, well, the well, prices I mean, of the units are limited by DHCD. So what are the units going to cost? Well, I, 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 my memory is, for, for example, that the affordable units at, at Beale Street are going to be about 180, I believe. So I how, one, but I mean, then how come we can't buy units at Beale's Cove, which sell for that much, 
and buy those and then let people buy those instead That's of what the opportunity funding out it was well, yeah for. but I mean but as opposed to building Absolutely. bringing in a whole new big development in the woods you know and again you know again my whole open space thing we're going to cut down part of the park and plow all these units in there I just don't understand the philosophy why it's changed from the way I've seen it done in town to what the rush is to pack 40 units you're probably talk you could talk 80 100 120 people living on, on that one in that one little area I don't get it this, this has been going on for how many years I, I, don't, understand, I don't understand the rush yeah. we're, we're still at the planning stage for something the town privately needs 2005 was the town meeting yeah. Yeah. so again, again I don't disagree hmm. with affordable housing I just don't understand what this is all about Tim, I thought when you presented it before it came to about a quarter acre per unit I'm okay. sorry, Jim. It came to about a quarter of an acre per unit. Yeah. Which is the size of a lot of house lots in the town. It is. I, the, the plan that we that I did lay out really was a pretty appealing one. I mean, you know, we hopefully we'll get a better one. So is this is this proposal essentially 20 duplex units? 20. On this on this parcel. 10 to 20. 10 to 20. 10 to 20. Duplex units. Well, yeah, not necessarily. Yeah. I mean, I think that units. that's a concept. That's a concept. Right? Absolutely. And it appeared to be the concept that was most appealing to uh, my predecessor, the, the housing department. I, I think one thing we could say to Catherine, you know, is that the house price is set so that a person making income stated can afford it at 30 percent, paying it no more than 30 percent of income, so that you actually get a staggering of house prices. Um, it, the person at the lowest end isn't Well, I think Sally the raised the point the last time that there's a um, good quality ha housing that the, the house. higher quality subsidizes the more affordable units. If you have pe all people who are not, We're you know, there's, there, aren't any, there aren't any 60, I mean, 600, $700,000 houses to subsidize the quality in the other ones. No, I mean, that is a little bit much. of a mystery in terms of what the quality of these units and the, the lifespan of them are going to be in terms of building quality. Mm. So, I mean, I've, I've said before, I mean, I've, my, my concerns about it are pretty strong. They have to be quite similar, though, don't they? They, do. they have to be quite similar. I mean, when I was reading it, and I was picking up on the tenor of your comments, Kathleen, is the issue of the lack of diversity. Right. So, in other words, there's all <coughs> lower-income residents living in a large development, which in other cities becomes a project. Right. right in time and so the issue is how to develop something that gives the opportunity for people of lower incomes to live in the town but do it in a such a way where they're not in, you know warehoused and one maybe that's a bad word no and i mean i think that that's that's a word that comes into my mouth project warehousing does that <laughs> you know why are we doing something like that in hingham i don't understand i mean i raised this last time um I get, and, and I've spoken to some, I presume this development would be in the Foster School District. It, I mean, this is the one that's most geographically proximate. And in talking to some parents and, and actually a few teachers, and they had concern about the, the school bus that pulls up to this place or this, the identification of this. It's, at least as it's conceived, to your point, it's 100% affordable. It is, and, and, and that creates the maximum units of new affordable, I, I get it, from 50 to 120. I don't know what we do either in the design, construction, materials, finishes to make it s not have that stigma. Right. Um, or, if there's n or, or if just the sociology of kids who go to school with the bus that pulls up at this place and they say, well, those are the projects, no matter what we do. Because and, it, and, it's I, and hopefully we don't, but I just I I guess I'm going to respectfully disagree with you. I, I hope and, that and I, people don't I, do I, that. And I think if you look very carefully at that second document I provided you tonight, those salaries could be salaries of school teachers who could live in this subsidized development. How many school teachers make 112? These they could be people. firefighters. They could be police officers. Those but, but are the types of people the, that will qualify uh, under this particular I, development. I'm not, you know, I, I guess it's, yeah. it's yeah. Kathleen's, as she described it, if, if people think with, with 40B, whether it's a, an evil, because it is in terms of its 
land use sort of the club over our head in terms of deciding what you get to build where, but it creates a mix of units so that you can't point to one and say, where's the affordable one or two or five? Um, this creates maximum number of units serving people with a broad diversity of incomes. I, I agree with that. Thank you. Um, it's the perception, and I don't know, can we create something that doesn't have a stigma attached to it. Right, I and the other point is, it's not even I on a city street. I, you're going to go. You're going to have saying. a path going behind the DPW building, and it's going to be plunked in there. It's not even on a city street. It's in the woods. I think. And I mean, to me, it's and then let's hide the buildings in the woods, and that's where the poor people live. I, I and I know you're saying about <coughs> teachers and nurses and how, town employees, <coughs> but we heard that this is not. You cannot give priority to these folks. It's open to anybody who wants to come, get in the lottery, and move here. It's not just, because I think that's what I heard at some of the town meetings. We're building housing for teachers and firefighters, but that's not what I think this is. It's open to everybody, and maybe that's a good thing, but it's not just for the Hingham's, Hingham employees to live here. Well, and so I think you should be clear I, on that. I, I, interesting. I, I don't think design review is the really teachers. the purpose of this committee right. we're right. supposed to make recommendations about community housing affordable housing we have a substantial housing reserve we've got a problem with homelessness in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts we've got a problem with uh, people needing housing Hingham needs to create affordable housing we need to create what another 300 units or 320 units um, there isn't a lot happening to do that. It seems to me that the, the town board that is responsible for doing this and for looking into creating ways to have affordable housing is coming before us and saying, let us get to this planning <coughs> stage to, um, so that we can meet our obligations with respect to affordable housing. And I think it's something we should strongly support um, with respect to uh, the proposals. But we're putting a toe in the water, and then we've sunk the funds into it. I think it's, to me, it's, we already have a philosophy about what is going to be built, where it's going to be built, how many of these things are going to be built there. I grew up in an inner city. I know what projects and stigma for, for people. So, I mean, that's, I guess that's my saying. And that is actually well, one of the same arguments that was made at town meeting in 2005. You know, I'll I, just conclude by saying yeah, town meeting thing. voted for it, the Board of Selectmen unanimously voted for it, the Advisory Committee voted for it, and the Housing Trust unanimously supports it. And I think, Catherine, if you look at the, what's being built in the town now, I think we all know you get things like the Territory Park and, and Well, I mean, I've had my say, so I mean, I'm but nothing's being built in the middle range. I, I think that's what I was going to say is that, you know, Hingham doesn't have a planned unit development kind of zoning. And right. if there was some way, and I always get Bradley Park and Bradley Woods mixed up, but, yeah, you know, too. in the after the war, the, all those little houses yeah. were built for people that didn't have a lot of money and they wanted their first starter home. And I think that's maybe how we can sell this in a better way is to say this is we're trying to design a new development of of houses maybe it's not Your duplexes because honestly i think that has a little different stigma if they were little houses on little lots that they were starter homes and this is a way to allow new young families or the teachers or the firemen and that whoever that doesn't make a lot of money have the ability to buy their first home that gets sold to the next, they move on to Main Street and the next person moves in. And I think that's I know, I, how it has to be I, sold I, or directed. You know, the, the one comment I want to make is because every th uh, meeting I've been to um, regarding the master plan is the fact Hingham is getting older. And there are older people in this town who cannot yeah. afford to stay in their homes. And to me, it's, you know, I love they the starter the home idea, yeah. but to be honest, yeah, or, or I'd love to believe that's yeah. when we don't get it more is, concerned yeah. with it's schools. A, a it's role. the older people who it's need, um, they're the ones who can't stay in it's Hingham. It's a circle, anymore. you know, yeah. Yeah. whether yeah. the young yeah. people move. I mean, no, how I many of these it. new developments that we right. thought were all going to be the empty nesters and it's the young people like Black that moved in that I think no one was quite that they were all surprised about so you're right those right. small houses may be for the older people the 
the single people, whatever, you know. Yeah. But I think that Absolutely. the ability to have some smaller homes in town mm -hmm. um, that are, they become affordable just by right. They're smaller. They're on smaller lots. Yeah. One of the opportunities that we have here is we do have a flexibility for uh, residential development by law. One of the options we have here is that this could be an opportunity to do some planning. Looking at it from the other perspective. So, in other words, the idea that it can be a proactive option and not an imposed option has some, has some future in terms of opportunity. For that. Absolutely. So, uh, the question is, is how does it get translated and developed to the next step? And thereby, that would set the stage as to what the program is, who are the, de what's the demographics, who are this, is this being aimed for? We know is the economic side in terms of the income levels, but there's also, I think, I agree with you on the demographics. Mm -hmm. We've also seen that 40 percent of the town is over 55. And it's going to be higher in 2020. <laughs> Close to 50. Did you want to say something? Sure. And just a couple saying. comments. One following on what Sally, because I know where I moved in with my family back 10 years ago was at one time the, the starter home neighborhood, or at least one of some starter homes. and. Ourselves included, unfortunately, we, rather than moving on to a bigger house as our family expanded, we expanded the house, and now it's essentially not affordable in the realm of what we're talking. So that's been a problem, is that so many homes, rather than moving up, they just build on. And you've seen that around the town. It's very few people I know in my age range haven't done something along those lines. I see many right along the roads today. Um, so that, that is, I, I, it seems like we all want the same goals. It's just a question of how to go about it. But um, just my other comment was just more of this piece of information, the first piece, um, you know, I, which is, I find very helpful because when you said hanging doesn't meet, it's 10%. It's, it's you know, of course, I always kind of wonder, well, how, how do we compare to all the other towns? And this is only what does, it, it skips the, yeah, yeah, the, but I, but this just these two pages. I look down and Hingham actually is not that bad. Not that bad. It's uh, you know there are a lot of towns that are far fewer percentage than we are. So, which are, you know if I would think if if I were really trying to make the case that we need to do this, we need to do it fast, we need to do a lot at one time, then I'd like to I almost expect to see where we're way down the ranks of towns, and this doesn't give me that. Sense. I'm almost right. like, well, what is the rush to do this? Um, the, the problem is so that whether you're at 6.3 percent or 8.9 percent or 1.2 percent, the fact is percent. that if, once the developer comes in and you're below that 10 percent, mm -hmm. you are subject to an unfriendly movie. Mm -hmm. So if there's an emergency, and I don't, you know, yes, there's an urgency. We need more affordable sure. housing desperately in this town. Mm -hmm. Uh, but it doesn't make any difference if you're below 10%. You are fair game for development. And to, to be clear, yeah. I think the ZBA, they've done a good job with the actual projects like, you know, food, food meadows and <coughs> support, yep. uh, whiting lane. I mean, they've, they've done a very serious job and done a good job of it. One thing, I hate to pour cold water on things, but when you look at the SHI units, the listed official yeah. units that count, in a lot of these rental projects, as we know, of them are market rate has been quite high. And, and this is done this way to encourage building rental housing. But the actual, I'm working on a report on this right now, and this is very helpful because it's a great, a great illusion. You've got so many, well, yeah, well, maybe two thirds of them, maybe a third of them are really affordable. You know, procedurally, this is accurate, but it's not uh, not quite as rosy as it looks in terms of. But and as a trust, you know, we do look at all the options, and that's why we're here asking for the opportunity funding because that will sprinkle it trickle you throughout the town. So it's not just in one particular place. So. I, I don't understand the, the idea of a rush because it seems like the town has looked at this and voted on it a long time ago. Um, we're looking at a two-year planning process now before construction. Um, it's really the housing th uh, trust's uh, area of expertise that is applied to this, uh, not ours. And there's no rush in terms of, we're not gonna get to the no 40B level because there's no way there's gonna be 300 
right. subsidized right. units that are going to be built in the foreseeable future in Hingham. I, I think if there's a rush, it's because people out there need affordable housing. Um, that, that really should be our imperative. Yeah, I, I, get, I just I will say I do applaud the, the concept behind the having the design money based on what's happening on Beale Street now in terms of controlling. I, I just, you mentioned it before, I just want to be on the record saying I think that's admirable to be able to design something and control what gets built as opposed to having the responses be all over the place. So I think that maybe we've jumped into the, the notion of all affordable and, really, you know, but the idea of having this design money, I applaud that concept, so. Yeah, I think a lot of people missed that five or six years ago the trust had, you know, put up an RFP, got five or six social housing community builders, several others, came with a whole variety of pretty attractive options. They chose a, a affirmative investment and then the market collapsed and it never happened. But I mean, we went through this whole process of RFP, multiple terms, great, great discussion, carefully thought out choice, and then it, it, it stopped. When I first came to in front of you folks to just to kind of give you a broad <coughs> idea of who's on our trust. We have a banker, we have a developer, we have a contractor, we have an architect, we have an engineer. You know, we, we have a great group of talented people who will make sure that the interests of the <coughs> community are developed for us. And can I make one more quick comment? Think about what's in the neighborhood. The duplex leases, maybe some ones here and there, are a lot less impact appearing than the four and eight units together in Hingham Woods or Bill's Cove. We're going to find that out too. We're going to yeah. find out when we get our suggestions. I mean, you're, you're, you're already more consistent with what's around the neighborhood. And the committee members. We're not going to have a big building. That's, that I can guarantee everybody in this community. Everybody in this room. That's not, we're not going to have the big building. And that's just the. That's an example of a nonprofit developer who would likely be interested in our project. The committee members are all members of our Hingham community, right? Right, absolutely. Uh, they're, they're fully aware and involved in public service and in uh, working for the betterment of the community. Um, any, any further questions or comments from by me? I'm going to get to them. I want to check in with the committee first. Uh, I mean, it's it, to, uh, Vicky raised earlier about the the notion of as the you know with the master plan as the mm -hmm. population ages. I mean, is there some consideration here for fifty five and older? Some portion of this being age restricted, or is that not part of what the warrant article was? No, no, it, it wasn't part of the warrant article. But I do think we all our options are open to us. We okay. have not made any. You know, we don't, no, no one has come in with any preconceived ideas at this point. Although you still probably can't restrict it to Hingham people either. No, you can. In terms of 55 and over, you, although you, maybe they would open. You try. You try. Yeah. Go has it, did. <laughs> well, you know, I take it back. And then not just you can't restrict. Yeah, you. They come in first. I told you folks that they, um, uh, giving the Hingham folks a, a little bit of a, uh, a leg up is still legal today. And that would be part of our, 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 our LIP application. Um, but I just can't tell you that it's going to be legal tomorrow. No, I think Vicki's point is, is attractive, because to provide a, a option in town that, you know, it's not a 55 in order that you need to have an $800,000 house. You can have a, I, I think that's uh, But I mean, it has a lot to do with how you design it. Obviously, if it's a one bedroom unit, um, most likely it's going to be a single or a, a couple. I mean, they're not coming with their four children or a, they wouldn't go into the unit. I mean, that's the way it's done other places, so. We, we have no preconceived notions. Okay. Anything further you, you wanted to say about uh, either the discretionary fund or the opportunity funding? I think we get those concepts. Yeah. Great. Uh, any members of the public? Uh, Advisory, want to say anything about this? Faith Burbank, 17 Andrews Isle. Just one statement confirming what you're saying. The master planning process in both sessions were very clear that the aging population was the population that needed to be addressed between now and 2030. What are we doing to uh, pay attention to what's coming out of our planning process? Thank you. I'm sure the uh, housing 
Folks, we'll put that on their agenda. Well, it's already on their agenda. In fact, $50,000 flexible spending request we have, one of the examples we gave you is that some, we may be able to assist the housing authority in putting together an RFP or something like that for $55,000. Okay. Any further from members of the public or committee? Thanks, Tim. Oh, Thank you. Can I, can I ask one yeah. question? Sure. Can you, when you do one of these um, for 55 and older, can you specify it to be 65 and older instead? I mean, is there any restriction on something like that? I just throw the question out. <coughs> I, don't know. I don't know off the top of my head. Okay. I mean, is there something magical about 55 versus yeah, 65? 55, a lot of people I, 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 still working. have children yeah. working. Yeah. Yeah. 65 to me seems more like, you know, you may be retired and need yeah. more. And In other countries, they still have babies. <laughs> Yeah, close to 55. Thanks, Tim. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I've got to keep up with the news. Yeah. <laughs> and there's nothing to say. You can't say it's more. Yeah. Um, Lisa, the second uh, parish? When you put, you put old people in the room, they did. Stop, Stop calling us old people. They said that for your minute. We're not old people. <laughs> Poor Bob. <laughs> he thinks we put him in a home. <laughs> <laughs> What'd you say? <laughs> <laughs> He's over here calling you old people. I have bigger drawings, but I don't think that they're going to be able to ram with this. Cover this. Yeah, that's <laughs> the most. How best to how best to put this on the TV? I know. That's rock on the street. And the barn's going down. Yeah. So. We've been through several revisions of our proposal since we started this, and I think. <laughs> oh, sorry. Um, so we've taken every suggestion that your committee has given us and tried to respond as quickly as we could, um, you know, given our circumstances. So um, the money that we've spent so far, you know, out of our own budget has just gone into consulting with somebody who has a design engineer uh, construction background to, for feasibility, basically, um, after your site visit and said, oh, the south side would actually be more functional, which, you know, we agree. So after the last meeting, and for your suggestion, I resubmitted our proposal um, just before the holidays, and I think Carol made sure that you all see that and have that in your folder. So the resubmitted proposal is to break down the project hopefully just into two stages. But at least the first stage is the design stage. Oh sorry. So um, you know that includes fleshing out all of the you know more specifics with the design including you know interior elevations and of thing, what happens to the inside space, which, you know, for us, it's just as important what, ha what happens to the outside space, um, but I feel like the reason why this is in this committee's interest is because what happens on this <coughs> street obviously matters to you guys. Um, so that is what my resubmitted proposal is for, is for a design budget, preliminary site work, which there is some that has to be done. Um, and I feel kind of part of that resubmission includes fundraising. So we don't have a specific plan for it yet, but when I brought that back to the leadership board, they felt confident that since we were able to raise funds to build a bathroom on our main floor, that you know this is a project since it benefits the whole community, <coughs> um, that we would definitely be able to. And I've already gotten a couple phone calls from people within the congregation, you know, willing to start the seed money for our capital campaign um, whenever we start that. But I really feel like I can't bring out that capital campaign until I have a full design to show them so they know exactly what they're donating towards. So um, I think that's it. I mean, that, so this is basically looking at it from the south side. Um, it's just this little addition here. It's, um, you would enter in here, and you could either go from here into Cushing Hall or this way up a ramp. And that's and about where the front door is, right? It is. It's just um, bringing out the door to Cushing Hall a, a little bit 
to allow some turnaround space, you know, if somebody has a wheelchair or walker, um, whether they want to go up into the sanctuary or into Cushing Hall, which Cushing Hall is the main distribution area when the food <coughs> pantry holds its distributions. So I feel like they'll use it. We have several AA meetings there. You know, quite a few of those people would benefit even just from having Cushing Hall um, brought out and having this entrance more flush with the pavement and eliminating that step up. Um, that alone is beneficial, but having, you know, the ramp into the sanctuary is, you know, another just added benefit to that. So that's, you know, where a lot of the concerts happen and um, memorial services and there's just lots of people. So this isn't a mechanical <laughs> lift, it's just a ramp. It's not a mechanical lift, which there's a lot of, you know, that makes it a much more functional and gives the project a, a much more longevity for the community. It's not something that's gonna have to be replaced in 20 years, hopefully, <laughs> when I anticipate, so. So do you, do you have any um, quotes for the design phase? So I did, in, um, I think we t I talked about this before, I did have a very rough estimate drawn up, which is like the worst case scenario, and then we kind of work backwards from there to see how we can bring it down. Um, I estimate, and I put that in my promote proposal, that it'll be somewhere in the 75 to 90,000 range, which seems to be on par with um, some of the work that Old Ship did and some of the other work that was a couple other similar projects around town. Not necessarily handicap access, but small additions. Um, so the design, process is usually 10% of the overall budget. So you can expect the design process to be like <coughs> around $7,500 if the total project comes in at 75,000. So it's like seven. So that's that's the. Are you requesting ten thousand or seventy five hundred? Well, I I put ten thousand in um, because I thought that whatever was left over from the design process would go towards the preliminary site work. So we have a gas meter that's right at this entrance right now with these exhaust pipes that basically blow out at you <laughs> when you enter. So. Okay. They can't stay there with the addition put on. They have to be moved. Um, so part of that money would go. And you know that's a really rate limiting thing because you have to contact National Grid, which could take forever, and get them to come out and do that. So I'm hoping to be able to get that, those kinds of things done so that once we have our money raised, you know, we can just, and the, you know, the, we have all the plans, we can just start and that. It'll be a very short kind of, start to finish construction time. You know, since we're, like I mentioned before, don't operate in the summer, the food pantry shuts down somewhat for the summer, that that's a really good time frame to be able to get the whole project done in a reasonable amount of time. Like, that's far out now. Like, it's not this summer, it's, you know, hopefully the next summer. One of the things that I might suggest in, at this point, given the level of information that's been developed, we're still in a preliminary phase, preliminary mode. <coughs> I would put a contingency on the design um, proportion mm -hmm. of this, and you know, if it's seventy-five thousand, I think as a preliminary project budget, and we've reviewed that, and I think the critical reduction there was to be able to do a design that would provide accessibility without a lift. Mm -hmm. So that was a really good step in the right direction. But I'm thinking where you are, there are some unforeseen conditions here. Uh, once you get into the design, I think we'd, it probably would be appropriate to carry a contingency. So I would, I would recommend that, that if it's preliminarily seen at 7,500, I would go 10 just so you have some protection so that you can get, get everything done you need to in this phase. Um, and I think then you'll have an overall plan, which this, this phase will essentially identify the real cost. It'll have to be scope developed, project defined, mm -hmm. and then estimated. Mm -hmm. And so I could see a 75,000, I could see this being 100,000 based on what I know of the scope. You know, but it's still, we're, we're still in the preliminary phases and there are things that are not totally known. My memory was the last time we thought the cost seemed a little high. At As 120. At, at, well, it was 106, I think, was that, that budget. But like I said, you know, we came in on the high side of that, you know, trying to sort of pad the budget to take into account that when you finish a project, 
There's all kinds of things like landscaping, you know, stonework, you know, walkway or um, painting and those kinds of things. So I wanted the worst case scenario, like what, you know, so we, we kind of knew, like, where, where are we going with this and what's the worst that we can anticipate, knowing that we can work backwards from there. So some of those costs might not be uh, CPA qualified costs. No, I know, right. Um, this but you need. Has Roger looked at the costs. I didn't look at Roger, and he thought that that was basically on par. I mean, without you know too many specifics <coughs> and taking into an account that it's an old historic building, and you don't know you could have a termite infested <laughs> sill or you know anything. You don't have no idea what you're going to run into. Okay. Plus, I think the materials that you'd want to specify, given the historic nature of the architecture, mm -hmm. the materials are going to be a higher cost. Mm -hmm to be consistent with the quality of the original building. Um, I, oh, no, I, I, I want to first just to applaud you for your responsiveness and your continual fine tuning of the application. Um, I, I don't think that goes unnoticed by all of us, given um, what we've seen. Um, uh, it, I guess I'm not clear in terms of, so this is a request for design. Um, is it anticipated? I, I guess I haven't. You, you've talked about capital <coughs> campaign. Is the mm -hmm. capital campaign intended to raise all of the construction costs, or do you anticipate coming to this committee next year for money for those construction costs? I anticipate that we would come back to the committee for the second phase, and once we kind of get a sense, like I know that we were able to raise fifty thousand dollars for the <coughs> bathroom project, that we should be able to raise at least that amount for this project. Okay. Mm -hmm. So whatever, you know, we determine kind of the balance to be after we've explored all of our fundraising options. And I, I, mm -hmm. I do think because this is tied to something that's bigger than just our bathroom was, you know, really internal and personal. <laughs> and this is something that's kind of more open to the community. And we can definitely, you know, tie into other things that we've services that we provide there that will make it more appealing, hopefully, to have some donations that are that come from outside our congregation. So it, it's a small congregation. We can't keep tapping, <coughs> you know, for everything that needs to be done because, you know, it's an old building. It, it's going to need a new roof at some point, you know, which that falls on us. Yeah, and we, when we have, I, I, I know I've, I've had thoughts and I'm sure others have about, you know, with providing ADA compliance um, for historic buildings. Um, you know, the scope of work that you would anticipate for after the design process will encompass many things, facade, <laughs> windows, doors, <coughs> historically accurate materials. Um, I know that there's concern if we provide, you know, if this committee supports ADA compliance in one historic building, uh, owned by a nonprofit, a, a religious institution. Will every historic building in town be coming to this committee for ADA compliance? I just raise that as something we are. Uh, I thought when I read, you know, what the scope of your purpose was, that this kind of fell into that scope, whether it's a religious building or just, you know, because it's historic in a historic building. So not every religious building in town is Absolutely. historic, and not every building is in a, a you know, on a major thoroughfare. So, yeah, you know, I, and, and a lot of those churches might have a better means for, you know, providing that access themselves, you know, without having to come to a community committee. But I mean, to say, I mean, I, I think this sounds great, but I mean, is ADA compliance part of historical preservation? <coughs> yes. yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, I wasn't yeah, sure. It is. I think also there's the one of the strong components of this uh, application is is that this this project is going to help this congregation not only serve its own congregational needs but more you know on a larger scale this, this church provides an incredible contribution to the community in terms of the food pantry mm -hmm. and you know that mission is is something that's bigger than this church and bigger than this church's. I think um, when you consider the contribution of the commu community, it's a, it's a small organization providing a huge contribution. And to me, that, that also is a major barrier here in terms of access 
Yeah. And we've talked about that in earlier yeah. meetings. I yeah. think yeah. we all agree with I that. agree. And it's very similar to the Masonic Lodge proposal and to uh, the Girl Scout House proposal. Uh, we've got historic buildings with groups that are actively and broadly serving the community. Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't know whether that's going to come down the pike later on, but I think we should welcome all qualified applicants. Mm -hmm. And um, the definition of rehabilitation in the Community Preservation Act specifically includes improvements to comply with the Americans with Disabilities Act and other state, federal, state, and local building or access codes. Can I, I just wanted to make one comment. I just think you've done a marvelous job oh, in responding you. to the committee. <laughs> thank um, you. So I wanted to congratulate you on that. I happen to know some of the leaders of your church and know that they are already getting ready for a capital campaign and fundraising for this. And I mean, so considering where you started and where you are tonight, I mean, you've done everything you could possibly do. So well, I it's think a terrific job. Ultimately, all of your suggestions have led to a better project. So I have to thank you for your insight on that because I think really this is much better than where we started from to begin with, so. Thank you. Any Thank questions, you. Thanks, comments from the Any questions or comments from the public? Great. Thank, Thank you. you all very much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Great job. All right. Thank you. Good night. Um, I, I mentioned last night, Sally, that uh, uh, looking forward to next week when we have to sharpen our pencils and uh, determine what our recommendations are going to be, that uh, I would welcome each member in sending me, uh, just to me, so we don't have any open meeting problems, uh, their thoughts about uh, how they would see uh, making recommendations, at least in a preliminary way. Uh, this is not a vote. Um, it's only gathering a consensus of, uh, or seeing if there's a consensus of thinking along certain lines. And uh, in view of <coughs> uh, what happened with the open space proposal tonight, we may actually be in a position where we want, might want to think about uh, is there money we want to set aside for the future uh, rather than spending it in this funding cycle uh, in some amount. Uh, so I, I don't think that people should feel compelled <coughs> to in some way uh, write down numbers that get to a zero balance uh, at the end of uh, their deliberations. So, and it, yeah, I would agree. If, any, if anybody wants to have any preliminary discussion about that uh, before next week, uh, we can we can do that now, or or we can move I, to. I have a question. Sure. Oh, I, I, but I didn't know if this was the appropriate time. Um, the one question was uh, just when we're looking at the Boy Scout land, the yes. added costs. Yes. Where, where all the costs are added, uh, uh, this isn't about the Boy Scout land, it's just where they're being added to the land, but then we're also adding it over to the conservation uh, fund request. We're not just, that was retrospective. Right. We're not planning to do that in the future. We're trying to carry them all with each acquisition okay. moving forward. So that the money that they're requesting for their fund. I think includes three properties that weren't covered in or the, in for the something behind and for things okay. that weren't budgeted when we did Sydney's pond last year we didn't account for some of the unforeseen legal okay costs. I just wanted to make sure there wasn't an overlap so that going forward all properties would always be considered with all of these uh, costs up front so the oh. request for the conservation fund this year isn't something that's going to be replenished every year we're kind of look at all costs beyond what the proponents are going to receive that we or the town may conceivably have to pay for right. and including them within our recommendation so that we know those funds are covered and then we can adjust the conservation fund or the CPC fund. Right, so those funds go to whom? They they would be you they don't go to the proponent. No, no, I so, know that. <laughs> so, so they're example, reserved by us. The, the uh, on the Boy Scouts, for example, mm -hmm. they've already spent five hundred dollars right. for an appraisal. Right. So uh, they basically are asking us to 
probably if they've already paid it, we would pay them for the appraisal. Right. Uh, we're going to have legal costs to close on the property, which is one of the outstanding issues. We have to kind of take a look at what those are likely to be because the, the issue relates to whether there's been a properly recorded succession of trustees from the 1950s to the present. Um, and we're, I, I believe we were told that there hasn't been. Right. And so what is a conveyancing attorney going to have to do to assure the town that they get good title to the property? So but is that fund, oh, I'm sorry, is that fund reserved? The legal fees are, do we reserve that to pay to, or does that, open uh, space? I was no, just trying to figure those, out where the money is Those go. funds, I think, would stay with they us. They stay with us. Okay. That's and, all I was trying and to And we would pay the legal fees right. for the project So we're basically setting those funds aside. We're, yeah. Not really spending them yet. Yeah, but, they're, an escrow. but otherwise, the right. conservation fund gets yeah. raided, and then if and there were other things Abby would want to do with that flexibility, it gets diminished. That's and what I want to I just have a question about the Boy Scout land. So, to, I mean, I think just, to, okay, just to yes. finish something up, just to the extent that they're not expended, they will be recouped by us. Right. Okay. Uh, as I want, they stay, basically stay with us. Go they're back putting in aside <coughs> for those general costs. reserve. Okay. Great. I'm sorry. Yeah, Thank no, you. Fine. No, I'm sorry. The, Thank you. Because the Boy Scout land, I mean, you know, one of the, the features of that, it looks like a, big, a bargain. But, I mean, is there some risk that we can end up with $60,000 of legal fees trying to chase the, the you That's know. That's why I want to address that before next week. Yeah. Right. Because yeah. You, know, you don't want to end up saying, like, we're going to spend and three times it just for legal and stuff, and then it becomes. I think what we're going to do in the interim time between now and next week is I'm going to contact our town council about it. I'm also going to talk to another attorney who has done a lot of work helping us on other nonprofits who have had similar issues and how do we resolve it? Yeah, it's, it's, I'm, I'm not a convincing attorney, but I mean, I, I know in some situations it's just a matter of recording an affidavit um, saying that I've known these people over the years and um, I, I've known them in succession within the Boy Scout troop and these present trustees are the successors to the others and I'll put that on the record and there, there really isn't anybody out there to challenge anything we don't mm -hmm. think um, but but it's something that a conveyancing attorney would know how to address and can give us a rough cost estimate on it but you're right we don't want a uh, sixty thousand dollar legal bill on a thirty thousand yeah. dollar land purchase. Yeah, uh, and then also, you know, and then it really comes like, well, wait, right. what are we buying here? You know, and it's just too much money. And we would probably need to put some contingent language in the grant agreement uh, with respect to that. <coughs> be good. Okay. So Thank is you. Arnold zero Arnold? Well, we didn't. Is, is there anyone here for zero Arnold Road? Or do we officially say that that's off the list? Considering they don't even well, I mean, we've had no communications yeah. that Carol has diligently emailed and communicated with okay. them. Okay, no, so just so officially it's one. Just formally for our minutes, there, there were other land uh, proposals that have been withdrawn? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, the Assyrian land on Levitt Street withdrew, uh, and uh, 875 Main Street withdrew, and I believe would want to resubmit for next year to be considered. Um, and Tower and Road. Tower. Tower Road is true, right? Uh, with the owner withdrew, uh, I believe it was end of last week mm -hmm. that they withdrew. Mm -hmm. <coughs> All right. It's funny, we had so much land and now we're down to like one. Well, I think based okay. on a mismatch between their request, our available capital and their request no. for funding and uh, their <coughs> ranking, I think yeah. they... Yeah, I had open space. Combination. Wild about any of them. Yeah. yeah. Say again, what else has been withdrawn? Tower Land? Tower Road. 85 Tower Road. The Assyrian Land. Which is zero, uh, I don't know what number, yeah. Levitt Street. Yeah, 875 Main Street. Yeah, 875 Main Street. That's 260. <laughs> and then 173 and Whiting was also Street. withdrawn. 173 Whiting was yeah, withdrawn. So yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's start. Is the property no longer on the market? Did they? I, I thought I understood. Is the sign in front still? Yeah. There's a sign. I think the sign never came down. It's been I, thought it clear. I thought they were supposedly changing brokers and then they had this <coughs> possible deal with a.
company that wanted to make it a corporate headquarters and and conservation, I thought, was still actively Are you talking with them. Uh, yes, I've been. I've talked to, to the owners <laughs> as early as recent as two days ago, and they, they were just they just gotten back from their holiday travels. Um, so they they were hoping that this Saxon group um, could still could still be worked out, and I, that would certainly be a benefit to us. Um, Whiting Street or, or Arrow Road? This is Whiting Street. Whiting Street, 175. Are they yeah. realtors? Are they realtors? It's a real estate development company that uh, owns um, <laughs> oh, the shopping yep. plaza in Plymouth. Uh, Independence? Colony Place. Mm -hmm. Wow. Oh. So, yes, but, and they had been in conversations with, with Jim Morris, the Open Space Committee, prior to the holidays. Mm -hmm. and. Um, but that's all contingent upon this um, rezoning of sorts. That's the only way that they could occupy. Um, Were they going to keep the house intact? Was they would. The house? And do we know? They would make some revisions in, 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 in the interior, but the exterior would be. And the zoning, do you know the status of that zoning request? No, but I, apparently that comes up every month. OK. There's, okay. So the deadline for February now is probably January 15th. OK. And, um, so that's one reason why Ellen she actually called me this time and said, "Can we get? Is it possible to get that on the February, you know, zoning request? Because she would need to sign it as the owner." And uh, but I don't. I've never had a conversation with Saxon Group. The only one who has is Jim, and he. When I asked him about it, he said that, "Well, it's, it's a lot of things. It's a new year. They're they're, they're they got other things going on. So I I haven't contacted them." Sure. Um, but but yeah, it's it's, it's going to be relisted. They're hoping actually to bump the price up. They feel like it's it's worth more than it's currently listed for. And obviously that's and makes it harder. If the Saxon for Group or someone else bought it, <coughs> commercial entity bought it, would they be cons would they consider uh, splitting off the back land? Or yeah, they, they the, the Saxon Group definitely would. Yeah, all like four acres. Since, since I made the observation that maybe we will not be spending um, all CPA funds this year. Um, let me ask the question, particularly of, of those of us such as conservation, uh, recreation, um, housing, if, if there are things on the horizon for next year, that we should then take into active consideration at this point is something that we want to save for and be ready for. <coughs> or we can Would bring you like to go first? <laughs> we could bring the full boat of the barn forward <laughs> since we yeah. had uh, regrouped today and we're committed to only asking for the first phase. Um, again, as I think most of the people in the committee know, the town hall has a space committee as we speak looking for more space at town hall. There is a space problem and the barn is part of an answer to that because it will be utilized by <coughs> seniors, um, recreation, um, very likely town meetings, uh, not these kinds of town meetings, but town events of some sort. So, you know, it, it certainly would be a, a good way to get it. in play at this point. All right. Do we right. know about the town capital? Because that was the X factor of if the we found that Ted Alexiatis is away until the end of this month. So, <laughs> the end of the month, <laughs> or something like the twenty-first. His twenty-first. Oh, all right. Well, he's he's is not here now. <laughs> what would the revised amount be? Would be the four twenty-five. It would be it would be about four twenty-five. Around four hundred to four twenty-five. Was it five? It would be four hundred because they we're looking for one seventy-five. Right. From capital outlay for a total of five seventy six. Right. I know there's a thousand dollar math error. <laughs> but yeah. there was a question of, uh, I mean, if we couldn't get the full amount of money from capital outlay, <coughs> it wouldn't be a one year project. It would still be a two year project. Right. Mm. So um, if we, that's an important question. Right. Well, and this is why we wanted to talk to Ted today because he had already shared with us that he was very much for this due to the space situation at Town Hall. Um, if Irma were here, I think she'd be able to help and and kind of support this. But I think <coughs> others are aware. That's, well, I mean, that's my understanding as well. Right. Well, should we not lose sight of the fact that we have a million dollar credit card bill too? 
Um, we owe a million dollars on the historical society, which uh, is there any benefit to say, well, we can also make pay a larger, down. pay a larger amount on the bill, um, <coughs> so to cut down the expenses and pay that down sooner. Um, so, I mean, we owe a million dollars. Um, so usually you try to get rid of your credit card bills too. So I mean that's another option. What do you I didn't know about the credit card. About the second floor. So someday when you can afford a lift. It's only the, it's only the second floor, I mean, really isn't on the table and because it can be used for storage yeah. and the cost of it because it is such a historic building would be astronomical. I mean Sally can probably speak the best to that. But so half the floor area really is just sort of in, in, in suspended. Half the floor area really isn't actively being considered. Well, I mean, it's the whole, I mean, it's the, it's the, it's the main floor. Really. Main floor. Yeah. So, I mean, it would be used as storage. I mean, other than that, you'd basically be talking, you know, Millions. another floor. Elevator. Yeah, yeah. An elevator to keep the, all the, oh. uh, yeah. uh, just the whole barn topic is yes. interesting because Mark has divvied up the request into COC and CPC. And right. the capital outlay piece is slightly larger than what he's asked you. No, it's smaller. Get, it's smaller. 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 Oh, much smaller. Yeah. No, it's smaller. That was oh, next year. Be, I'm sorry. Right. He gave the capital outlay. He gave us the numbers. I don't have them. 75. How much is he asking capital for? 75. Okay. And he said when he did that, he just kind of arbitrarily right. picked it out. I don't know whether you want to consider taking out a 25 for him out of CPC if you have the money, therefore reducing the load on capital because capital is going to have more than they can pay for this year in all right. the projects. He may not get the money from capital. Right. I, it's just a thought. I don't right. know how, how well, much over We feel we're paying. It's a new question to get. I know we're all in the same boat. Right. We're on capital, so I'm just thinking if he's come to Put us more into so you get more right. than just the bathroom. How much now, given these five the dropouts and sense. changes in your request, how much is the total money being requested tonight? No, I don't think anyone's done the math. Have you got that? You got it right now? One point. Carol's got a great spreadsheet. Anyone want to take a guess? One point two. Hundred thousand dollars for next year, or well, less? Well, basically, I think we're we're dropping uh, four hundred thousand dollars for the uh, uh, the Rockland Street uh, yeah, right. project. Oh, that wasn't on the most recent one. Was it down to two well, two seventy? We're dropping two fifty or two seventy. Yeah, all right. We put one seventy five in for the bond, just based off the numbers. Yeah. Um, we're looking at one point three four seven, and you have one point five. Now, keep in mind, I'm taking out the four twenty four for the So, if your request is only four hundred thousand, we still have twenty four thousand. Yeah, we can't use that anyway. Right. So I did do that. But you're looking at right now, we went from 1.6 million to 1.3 million request. So you have 250,000. So we've got maybe 275 because we still have 24,000 in the housing reserve. Right. I mean, the issue that we dealt with last night with respect to the barn is. Can we get it all done so that it's the whole structure usable in one year as opposed to just the bathrooms? And there was concern that are we compelling this committee to have to fund another phase because all you got was a bathroom? Uh, that was a yeah, plain concern things. from last night. Although I have a problem with all you got is a bathroom. A bathroom is a really good thing. Yeah, but you're going to have to have a bathroom. I was yeah. That's right. Yeah, right, right. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> and how about the mother who's been there all day long with these kids? <laughs> but could you do more for him this year versus putting aside money right. next year? But if you put away just another little bit more, he may not get in any culture. He right. may he may need X amount. If you give him a little bit more, it's not going to get him the next phase. I don't know. I'm just thinking in terms of this multiple sources of funds and the fact that capital may say, we can give you 25. And Yes, well, that's something we need to think about right. before next week and <laughs> right. think, is the money there to maybe do the whole thing? Because, I mean, if we're, if we're doing <coughs> phase A this year, we're really doing it with the understanding we're going to do the second next phase right. next right. year okay. because it doesn't make any sense to do, do you have any, uh, the first part without the second part. Do you have any but sense of that? Can I just... I mean, we don't want to just talk about the barn. Well, I'm very <laughs> happy. <to. laughs> you know, uh, I mean, I've heard there are 
potentially desirable open space. <laughs> yeah, there's parcels coming down the road is in the future well, as well. On High Street, there's one there, and I think there's another parcel talked about off of um, Cushing. But, I mean, well, but it has estimates at all. On I don't know the costs, but okay. then again, I. Well, there's always a need. I mean, if we're but there's also the Barbuto property would be one so that would be. <laughs> if they if they change their mind. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, we did do our survey, and most people are interested in open space. And right now, we yeah, we're spending forty thousand dollars on open space, um, and really not buying much too much of anything right this year. Well, I mean, there is the that's, need. That's the way the, open space the works. The CPC so. has gone. Yeah, it is the way open space works. And when you look at the numbers, I think. Of all the CPA funds spent over the years, I think open space has got at least 70%. It's a lion's share. But I mean, that's it's, what people want, though. So that, so that is that's the right direction based on the direction we got. I mean, there could be an interest in banking money for open space to use if we get a trail plan. There'll okay. be a need for other money. I, 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 would, I would suggest if we can to try to bank and earn some interest because they're trying to protect natural resources, our water supply here. In and those properties come up quickly and, um, you know, th there's potential in the Weir River. Um, Did you mention there's a potential property coming up in that area? There could be. Okay. Yeah. Well, also too. I mean, if we have a hundred, exactly. we can't. We have to put aside Oil sixty thousand this year, anyways, right, for open space. Oh yeah, that's true. Because you're supposed to spend. Yes, we would have to be reserving uh, okay. open space money. That's sixty. About so say sixty thousand dollars, uh, or thereabouts. Oh well, one hundred and six. Yeah. One four five. Minus. One twenty. It's one twenty six. So we it's, have to do another it's, eighty. It's more like eighty, yeah. Yeah, so you have to put some money. I mean, it's because that's never come up before, I guess, because yeah. we always we've spend, always been over. Yeah, we've been over. Mm -hmm. yeah. But we're, if we're not spending, then, then we have to put that aside. It is more like 80. 80. So if that 80 were there, sometime yeah. in the middle of the year, well, that's yeah. well, that's not appropriated. That's reserved. So it's not as if a acquisition in the middle of the year, a project could. It's supposed to go to town meeting unless you have right. a special yeah. town meeting. Yeah. So, yeah. but yeah. sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Um, from the point of view of the historical commission, I, I know the bell tower is on the horizon in terms of tuning the bells, but uh, that's a the skate house could that's be a, something. Oh, that's a major right. cost, and um, I don't know where that's going to go. I don't, I don't know if there's anything else coming down the pike on historical. The skate house uh, uh, heritage museum is going to remain the major one. Yeah, but I guess that's what the <coughs> Skatehouse well, is under recreation. Is it, it, right. I, I don't know if it's, yeah. is it historic or recreation. I think it's both. Oh, and the the um, you know the it'll be done in the spring. So I mean it. The skatehouse plan know. will be. The whatever the whatever you funded last year. It's just yeah. a plan. It's just, it's just a plan. So they might be coming in so next year to say now we've so done we do. the plan. Right. What are we going right. to do um, with the building? Right. And so then we'd have to be spending money right. on that. I mean I don't know so what the benefit of reserving for a specific thing is supposed to leave it in the undesignated reserve. I mean, statute requires it. Yeah. Well, beyond the eighty thousand that we have to do, but we can well, leave things undesignated. What was the net oh, yeah. Yeah. So Absolutely. You're just trying to get an idea of things. We don't have to spend money. So I think probably best if Carol just updated the spreadsheet, put in the projected res reserves, uh, and and then we can give our thoughts to whether we want to do something with the barn. Mm -hmm. Maybe Vicki, you and Mark, and... Um, I think we also have to remember that it's not just a bathroom. It's the infra more infrastructure, the septic system, things like that. So Why, right? Well, the, the discussion last night was just the fact we're making, we're, to me, I feel we're reaching forward and we're saying that we are, we can't finish the project unless we go to next year. And last year we were saying we don't want to reach forward either the project's got to stand alone. So if there was no more CPC next year, you wouldn't have a, a usable building. See, but I disagree. You would because yeah, you'd have usable bathrooms. bathrooms. Yeah, but I mean, you buy, the then build like put porta potties out back. I mean, I mean for two hundred fifty thousand dollars. Yeah, you have to understand because it's a public building, it's prevailing wage. You know, it has to put up a, a, an ADA bathroom in your own house. Well, I mean, maybe we should talk. I mean, <laughs> you know, right. I don't know. If we're but no, it's on this. right. Uh -huh. Can I just clarify? Um, so the, the category that we have for recreation open space, 
are we going as a committee to keep it kind of separate? So eighty thousand, eighty thousand. You know what I mean? No, no, no. You want me to put eighty side aside? No, there's there, there are only three side. reserves. Oh, okay, right. Okay. I just there's an to open sure space reserve. There's the historic reserve yeah. and there's a housing okay. reserve. So. Uh, so we wouldn't have to set so aside we, eighty. Right. So if so we spend one hundred seventy-five at the barn, yeah, the ten percent yeah. is max. So okay. I don't have to. Oh, okay. That's what I just want to clarify yeah. with oh, the okay. committee that I do not have to put eighty thousand aside for our open space. Okay. You're yeah, correct. Yeah, thank yeah. you for that yeah. clarification. Yeah. 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 Because yeah. I was just thinking of the land part right. of it. But as a committee, you can probably do that. I may want to re <laughs> read how the statute was okay. written on that. Okay. Good. But we have to combine. Okay. I think they have to be combined, right? Anything else for tonight? A motion. Oh. Yeah, motion to adjourn. I second. Motion to adjourn. I second. <laughs> all in favor? Aye, aye, aye. 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 Thank you all. I've had three people sneeze. Hey, we got early tonight.